Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. Man, I've got such a special guest today with Rodney Mills and uh, he is an engineer and he's worked on so many great records. I mean, so many great records and his career has expanded over time that he's wor worked on extremely successful records in multiple genres, which is extremely interesting. You don't usually have that. A couple of quick announcements. I want to thank our mutual friend, Jeff Carlisi, also known as Jeff Carlisle, those in the know. <laughs> No. And uh, <laughs> thanks for hooking us up, Jeff. And also make sure you go to everyone loves guitar.com forward slash subscribe. If you're already watching us on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and the little emoji that looks like a bell that helps us get recommended by YouTube. And thank you for that. Okay. Uh, let me tell you Rodney's background. It's pretty extensive. He's an engineer. He's been in the music industry for over 50 years. He's earned over 50 gold and platinum records for engineering, producing, and mastering. He's originally from Georgia, started playing bass in a local band and began pursuing a career as an engineer back in 67. In 68, he became the chief engineer at Le Lefebvre. It's like Mylon Lefebvre. Lefebvre. Lefebvre Sound Studios in Atlanta, Georgia. During his three years there, he engineered records for local and national acts, including Joe South, Billy Joe Royal, The Meters, James Brown, The Winstons on what turned out to be one of the most important records, certainly in rap history, uh, Mylon Lefevre and scores of other projects. I only got turned on to Mylon recently. Um, I can't, I wish I could tell it without my head, but another guy from the South though. Uh, in 1970, Rodney was approached by Buddy Bowie to build a studio for him and become the chief engineer there. So Rodney co-designed and oversaw the construction of the famous, what became studio one outside of Atlanta. And for the next 16 years, Rodney worked almost exclusively there on loads of different projects as an engineer, as well as a producer. Clients here included BJ Thomas at the Atlanta Rhythm Section, where he worked on 11 albums, Leonard Skinner on four albums, all seminal in their career, 38 specials, same thing, seven albums, The Outlaws and others. In 86, Rodney left Studio One to become an independent produce, an independent producer, engineer, and mastering uh, engineer of uh, on his own without affiliation in any specific studio since then he produced records for 38 special again greg allman the radiators the doobie brothers and several other projects in 89 rodney produced billboard magazine's number one adult contemporary song of the year and that was second chance by 38 special in 94 rodney formed his mass what he calls rodney mills master house which is a mastering agency or mastering service in atlanta since then, he's mastered literally thousands of projects for national and regional acts, including Pearl Jam, The Wallflowers, Collective Soul, Kentucky Headhunters. Man, you know, Greg Martin's one of the nicest human beings I've ever met in my life from the Headhunters. What a sweetheart, man. Yeah. Uh, the Atlanta Rhythm Section. Now, this is where this is where you're not going to expect Gucci Mane, Bob Marley, Sugarland, Bone Crusher, The Drive-By Trucker, Zach Brown Band, Soldier Boy, Cheryl Crow. I was showing this to my daughter. She was like, you're talking to this guy? And I'm like, yeah, because <laughs> a lot of that's the music she listens to. Keith Sweat, Irene Cara, George Clinton and P-Funk, Glenn Danzig, Amy Ray, who was on this show. We had her on here, Shooter Jennings and loads of others. Uh, here's some of the specific records that Rodney's left his imprint on. Uh, the Winstons, there was a big hit they had called Color Him Father, and the backs, the, the B side to that was called Amen Brother, and it, it generated something called the Amen Break, which we're going to talk about for sure. For Lyndon Skinner, he worked on Tuesday's Gone, a Simple Man, Free Bird, Sweet Home Alabama, Street Survivors, What's Your Name, That Smell, and you know, all the songs on those records. Atlanta Rhythm section he was working on. He worked on Moonlight Feels Right, Spooky, Imaginary Lover, So Into You, and I'm Not Gonna Let It Bother Me Tonight. Alicia Bridges, he did I Love the Nightlife. Man, I grew up in New York City. That song was played on. <laughs> that was nonstop back in the day. 38 special, Rocking Into the Night, Hold On Loosely, Caught Up in You, uh, and Second Chance. Uh, Journey, he co-mixed that with Kevin Elson. They, he worked on the live Captured album. Worked on Greg Allman's record, I'm No Angel, and Before the Bullets Fly. Was Ricky Hirsch on one of those? No. No, okay. Uh, and the Doobie Brothers, he worked on Cycles and Brotherhood. Rodney's a member of the Georgia Music Hall of Fame, and he's also, which is, this is really cool, he served on the Board of Governors for NARIS, which is the National Academy of Recording Arts and Science, and that is the group that sort of oversees the whole Grammy process. Right. Rodney, thank you so much for your time, man. I'm so happy to hang out with you. Thank you. That was quite an introduction. I've got one correction. Yeah, yeah, please. One, one correction is uh, the Moonlight Feels Right was a group called Starbuck. Oh, man. You know that? <laughs> Let me tell you how stupid I am. I saw I saw that and you think I'm like, 
what is he talking about Starbucks? <laughs> so I, I was like, maybe he was ordering coffee or something. I don't know, Starbucks. Thank you very much. I should have. Starbucks. And I it was the uh, one kind of one and only time I ever recorded a marimba solo for a, a hit song. <laughs> That's cool, man. Well, you made it work. That was a great track. Really great track. Really good. Hey, uh, thanks again for your time. I appreciate it. And and I I'll say this to you again, because I said it before, you already made so much music that's impacted me. And I know tons of people listening to this. So thank you very much for all the great work you've done. You're welcome. Uh, I, I read somewhere that you either grew up on a tobacco farm <laughs> or you used to be a tobacco farmer before you got into music. Uh, from when I was born, 1946, uh, I think it probably took me about four, four or five years to get my bearings on the farm. But, uh, right after that, I started working in our family's farm and tobacco was our main cash crop that oh. we uh, grew every year. My dad was an excellent farmer and, and, uh, tobacco was during the summer months primarily. And that's, that's when we made all the money we were basically going to make for the entire year. Mm. So that was an important thing. And, and Craig, that was the dirtiest, nastiest, nastiest, <laughs> messiest uh, stuff I've ever worked in in my life. And it's kind of like as a kid and I'm getting on up and in my teens and everything. And it's kind of like, you know, if it's one thing I'm not going to do in my life is tobacco. It's, it's tobacco. <laughs> yeah. But man, what a work ethic your dad must have had and then passed on to you. That is not eat. That's that's hard was, living, man. It was intense. It was, yeah. uh, it was at one time it was seven days a week, uh, working that stuff and just going at it as hard as you could. And towards the end of it, my dad actually took on a second job uptown at a farmer's mutual exchange. So Rodney at the age of about 14, 15 was in charge of the whole production of gathering the tobacco and, uh, and putting it in a barn and, uh, and, doing all the processes with it. And dad would just drive out every now and then to the fields. <laughs> yeah. But what a great, yeah. Yes. When you grow up like that though, you appreciate, uh, I mean, work ethic is I, to me, I, I really think you could tell a lot about someone by their work ethic. People that have a good work ethic are generally good with everything for the most part, you know, for the most part, I think so too. Reliable I think so too. Yeah. because, because people that don't have a good work work ethic, you can't force them into having a good work ethic. <laughs> right. You either have that or you don't. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And it's kind of like something that, and you know, I don't know where that's uh, passed on from generation to generation, but uh, I was certainly exposed to hard work and everything uh, those first several years. And until I kind of uh, got a hold of music and that, that was kind of like a freak accident that happened. And how, did, how did that happen? I'll tell you exactly how. <laughs> yeah, man. When I was a sophomore in high school, this is 1962. All right. And my cousin, uh, second cousin, John Adams, we called him junior. <laughs> he, uh, he was a year older than me and we were best friends growing up because our family, our families, they, uh, were really tight and we did lots of stuff together. And, uh, he and I became very good friends, the best friend. And so just one day out of the clear blue, he comes up to me and says, Rodney, Tommy and I, which was another guy that was in our band to start with, he says, we're going to start a band and we want you to be in our band. And I looked at him, I said, Junior, I, I can play two chords on the ukulele. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I, I took two years of piano lessons, which I'd totally forgotten at that time. And he said, no, he says, Tommy's got a guitar and you've got an electric guitar and he's going to show us some chords and stuff and everything. So that, you know, and that began that process of just as a hobby, you know, it's something we kind of got together and, you know, the drummer at the band at that time didn't have a set of drums. He had a set of bongos and would practice over at Tommy's house. And, uh, his dad was the first Baptist preacher in, uh, in our hometown down in Douglas, Georgia. And so we practiced there. And so we worked up uh, six songs that we kind of knew in my church, which was the Mormon church, mm -hmm. we had a uh, youth group and everything. And so we decided they had a little stage inside the church there. And we said, so we are, that was our first gig. And we played those six songs, Craig, we played those six songs and everybody just loved it so much. We said, well, let's play those six songs again. Right. On. That's, <laughs> you know, I've heard, <laughs> I've heard, that's, I've heard this they, before. And this is the deal. 
at the end of that, my uncle, Uncle Olin, he comes up to us and he says, boys, y'all did a really good job. And he takes out his wallet and he gives us $5 a piece. That's and a lot got, of money. Well, okay, uh, up until that point, we're not even thinking money. And so he, people will pay us to do this. <laughs> so that right there kind of changed from it being something we could do as some kids and everything to something maybe we could pursue that maybe we could get a little bit better and uh, kind of do uh, shows and dances. Back then, dances were big things and proms and stuff like that. So that that one day he asked me that question and I agreed to do it. That was that was it, Craig. That's cool. It changed your life, man. Literally changed, changed my life. And here I am. <laughs> Gosh, fifty gold and platinum records later, man. <laughs> That's so cool. That's a great story, man. Did well, how was your dad as far as being receptive when you when he saw that you know tobacco farming is not your passion? I think he always knew that. It, you know, my my dad was the kind of dad though that uh, you know even when we got to play got to playing some gigs and everything, and I would come back in the middle of the night, and we were supposed to work in tobacco the next morning. I still had to get up work in tobacco. Okay. So my dad, I don't you know to start with, I don't think he ever said you shouldn't be doing that. And, but, it, and it wasn't one of these things where Rodney, I totally support you and everything, but, uh, but the deal was I needed to buy, uh, an electric base. I didn't have an electric base and base of what I wanted to play. So I taught my dad, I said, can we go down to Jacksonville and, uh, maybe get a, something that's a base and a little amp or something. And so dad, he agreed that we went, went down there together. And so we're going to this music store and we wound up buying a, a, a Fender precision bass and an Ampeg nice 18 inch, uh, B 18, you know, your flip top, uh, bass cabinet and everything. Now my dad spent 600 and something dollars. What a guy, what a good guy, man. And it's kind of like, you know, he wouldn't cook. Wow. And it was like in our hometown, there would be the recreation centers where we play gigs, like on Friday night or Saturday night. And I could still remember being on stage and, and every now and then I look up and I see my dad back in the back. And it was like, wow, I think he does, uh, like, so he's pretty supportive of you, like extremely supportive man to drop yeah. 600 bucks in that time. That that's probably about 3,500, four grand now. Uh, and I think about it and I said, you know, I guess I should feel bad because i never paid my daddy back but i got to remember all those years <laughs> worked in the back of, <laughs> never got in no, you, you paid him back about a hundred times man <laughs> no but that was cool that he said that he was like supportive and he said look as long as you still you do your thing i'm not you know basically i'm not getting involved that that's like great that's man now i'm gonna sound like an old man but that's how people that's what i did with my that's how people should do things with their kid everybody's like oh go ahead now you don't have to do anything i'll hire someone to do it. i'm like what you know, and I never, I mean, what are you teaching your kids? You know, that's not how life works. You know, you're going to go to your boss. And, hey, this is too much of work. No problem. I'll spread it out for you. That ain't going to happen. Right. <laughs> Shit, man. Well, yeah, by that same time, it became a, a part of thing. My, my dad actually quit farming and bought a restaurant. Oh my God. <laughs> he went from bad to worse as far as difficulty. Well, well difficulty, but he was very oh successful my. in the restaurant business that's and cool. uh, did really well. What do you and, do? What kind of restaurant? It was it's like a southern food kind of uh thing and it was the best of the best uh, that's cool man and uh and it was kind of like so i started college greater Rift from high school started college there and so it's kind of like at that time you know i didn't have to work on the farm anymore yeah and any potential date i got is kind of like let's go out to the restaurant and get something <laughs> to eat <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. That's, so that's cool, man. So you have real supportive parents. That's nice. Um, how did you get like, what was compelling and interesting for you about engineering that you, cause like, it seems like in reading your bio and, and background that once you got turned on to that, you knew pretty quickly that was your thing. I think it started, uh, pretty early on, maybe before I got into playing in a band or anything, I was always kind of fascinated that r radio fascinated me, how radio worked. And then, uh, and then later on, a little bit later on tape recorders, kind of like, wow, those are 
pretty cool and everything. So when I started playing the band, I spent a lot of my extra bucks on buying a tape recorder. I bought a tape recorder. It was a Roberts uh, Crossville 70, 770, something like that tape recorder. And it was, it was pretty nice recorded. So I'd get the, we'd do rehearsals. So I'd try to record the band and everything. Mm. And it's kind of like, and I was the guy in the band that kind of, I could hook up the PA, get all the microphones working. If I needed to fix a mic cable, I could do that and everything. And then along the way, we actually got, uh, were able to record in a studio a few okay. times. And it's kind of like, and I was totally blown away with that. And, uh, so that was still not the opportunity to get into recording until 67. And so as a band, we moved to Atlanta, Georgia and, uh, in 67 and we leased a little rec two track recording studio. That's, and you guys did this on your own? On our own. That's we were pretty, we did, we did pretty well as a, yeah. a band that never really made it, so to speak. And, uh, this is the Bushman, the Bushman. Yeah. We uh, leased a recording studio thinking we were going to make the next uh, Sergeant Pepper's uh, right. album and That's all right. on our two track. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two but everybody, you know, it's kind of like, okay, we've got this studio we're going to record. And I said, well, I want to be the engineer. And there was another guy with us that wanted to engineer too. So we both uh, engineered and kind of shared those things. And that lasted, that leasing the studio lasted a total of about eight months. And during that eight months, I kind of felt like that was my calling. And, uh, and so at that time, and that was sick, uh, you know, 68 was coming around. My wife was graduating from college right? <laughs> and she was not my wife at that time, but she was graduating from college. So St. You still with the same woman? Yes. 53 years. Dude, uh, God bless you, man. That is really cool. <laughs> That's cool to hear. Man. Oh, yeah, it is. It is. And, uh, we, uh, I said, well, I'm not real gung, gung ho about, uh, you know, I'm getting on close to 21, 22 years old. You know, I've had, a, <laughs> I've had a long run in this music. I paid in the band for seven and a half years. We're not, we don't think we're going to make it. And that's kind of like, so I started hanging out at another recording studio there in town, which mm -hmm. already had developed a few little skills in that little studio we had and everything. And, uh, and there again, I think the thing you sent me is like, I was the quintessential would be engineer that I did everything that they asked me to do. And it was, right. just, it was just a process, you know, it's kind of like, you know, if you talk about work ethic, I showed up on time or ahead of time every day, anything they wanted me to do, I would do it. And then it, it expanded to the point of the guy that owned the studio, Maurice Lefebvre, Mylon's <laughs> dad, a, a brother, I'm sorry. And, uh, and so Maurice was the engineer owner. And so he would engineer all the sessions. And so, so then he'd say, be in a session, he'd say, Rodney, go out there and move that microphone. So-and-so. And, -so, and, and I'd go out there and do that. And then and he'd say, Rodney, I got to take this phone call. Can you kind of watch the console and everything? And it's kind of like, and he tells a story. He says, I came in one day and as he says, uh, Rodney, come out here and help me. I got set up for this session we're going to do. And he, <laughs> And I said, uh, Maurice, I've already set up everything and I kind of gotten sounds and everything. And it's kind of like at that point he said, wow. And he said a few, a little short, uh, distance past that. He said, Brian, I'm going to hire you as an engineer, but you got to quit that band. <laughs> oh, so it went the uh, full circle at seven days a week thing. <laughs> so it went for me, uh, instead of the back of patch. I went to work for Maurice, got married. Mary and I got married in 68 and, uh, and, uh, I'll start working in the studio seven days a week. <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's a breeze compared to tobacco farming. Good Lord. Oh, I was, I, and, and once I got into it, Craig, it was kind of like, this is it, this is it. This is, this can't, this, you know, this is what I want to do. And it was, uh, at that time, there was only about three recording studios in Atlanta per se that you, that you would call professional studios. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so there was uh, if you wanted to do any kind of recording, you had to record book one of those recording studios. So each day and maybe four or five times a week, I'm doing four or five different kinds of music that I'm engineering. 
Oh, wow. That's okay. So that gave you that basic. That's really cool. So you had a ton of experience early on even. Yes. Because it, it went from, you know, like somebody playing, playing piano and somebody singing to like there being a, a, a chorus in there. And it's okay. kind of like, and then the next day it's R and B session. And then, uh, it, it just, it just every day, sometimes two times a day, you're doing two different things and you were not doing very many album projects at all. It was mostly that single kind of stuff. And, uh, but the work ethic, my wife graduated from college with a teaching degree and she taught first two years and we finally came to the real realization that we never going to see each other if we don't make a change. Right. So my wife, she, uh, I talked her into quit, stop teaching. And, and, uh, that was, that was a, a major decision. And, uh, one that I think has, uh, sustained our marriage all these years and me being in the music business is her being, uh, flexible to what I was doing, even though it was tough sometimes, you know, because it was that, eight, that, that thing, you know, Sky, I'll be home for dinner at seven o'clock. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be eight o'clock yeah. <laughs> and back, you know, just over and over and over again. And, uh, but she hung in there with me. Thank goodness. And, uh, yeah, man. and, uh, so, so that transition to that, uh, full-time engineering that took place in a short amount of time, 67, 68, I was chief engineer at a major recording studio there in Atlanta. And I was not only doing demo sessions, I was doing major record label projects, engineering for people. And, and you're not even 30 at that point. Not wow. even what? 30. You're not even 30 years old at that. No, point. I'm 20, uh, 22. Yeah. That's amazing. That's so good that you got to on the fly. You had to make all those adjustments real quick because you know, now you learn, okay, R and B, this necessitates this, you know, whatever the subtleties are gospel necessitates this electric guitar. I mean, that was like the best tuition you could have got, man. It was because, you know, at that time, 68, you got to realize that was the time of the hippie movement when then, then the real rock and roll bands first started and everything and martial amps came out and stuff like that. And in the South, there were a lot of really, really good guitar players just in the Atlanta area alone. You know, it's kind of like, and, and there's so many times a week, maybe I would be doing a session with one of those bands and everything. And it was kind of like, and it's kind of like me as an ex bass player and everything, I could kind of identify with the band and, and kind of understand what they were uh, wanting to do as far as recording and everything. And, and, my ambition back then was just to kind of help them try to do what they want to do, even though they have no idea right. what, they, what they can and can't do in a recording studio. So it, uh, so it's kind of like, uh, got, th got thrown in the fire and <laughs> was able. It, that's the best way to learn though, man, you know, sink or swim and you got to, and you wind up swimming and you, you're, that's great, great lessons there, man. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And it was, and, it, uh, it's kind of like that, that, you know, variety of music going around and around and around, even though later on I became, became kind of uh, pigeonholed into rock and roll music and doing rock music and this and everything. But when I went to the uh, mastering and everything, it was back to the 1968. Right. Where you every had day, something every day. Every day I'm doing something different. That's cool. So, did you ever come across someone coming into the studio and like as a, as a guitar player or whatever instrument and say, man, this guy or this gal is really good. And then it turned out later in their career, they, they were like massive. Not, not so much. Um, uh, I'd, uh, probably more rap artists than, uh, than rock and roll. There was that, a lot of, there was a lot of, uh, uh, guitar based, uh, bands back then I thought were going to do great. They had the talent. I thought they had great songs and everything, but it's still, Craig, it's, it's not very often you see somebody start out something, you know, very on a rudimentary level, like I did and make it all the way. Yeah. That's it's very, hard. very rare and very seldom, even though like you and talking about my career and all this stuff that I've been associated with and everything, it's a, to be involved with that many different people that were successful and everything is kind of like that 
it's like putting a you, you think that everybody could do this a lot more people but it's just not so i mean it's kind of like take the for instance the group uh starbuck yeah that did moonlight feels right right they were a bar band in atlanta and uh bruce blackman wrote this song uh, called Blue moonlight feels right and so we had the opportunity to go into a studio one where i worked and uh, recorded that well they were not known on a national level at all but they played during these clubs and bars on a weekly basis and made great money okay so they, they finally get a record company to sign them and mainly just for that song and it became a hit so then they had to go out and tour and they'd almost starve to death <laughs> Oh, because nobody would show up. Well, they, they, just, they had no following. You know, the, that, was a, that was a radio hit and everything. So they, it wasn't like they'd been doing all this touring and everything. So it's like months went by and it's kind of like they couldn't sustain themselves on the road. And, uh, but why wouldn't, how is that possible? Because it was a, I remember hearing that song all the time. It was a great song, really cool song. Well, they had a run there. I, I would say they had a run there. And, it, and Bruce Blackman was the leader of the band, the guy that wrote wrote the song and the lead singer and he was the a very smart guy yeah and he has made an entire career off that one song oh wow but hardly anybody else in that in that band or anything sustained a music career all this time anywhere close to what he has sustained yeah He's, but uh that was an instance where you somebody came in and we didn't think about that wow it's a really good song now i was involved in recording a few things that's kind of like that uh i didn't pay i didn't think it's kind of like sweet home alabama <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like when i heard the first then, 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 uh, the first guitar figure i say this is going to be one of the biggest songs of all time no no you didn't say that yeah that's <laughs> i think no. it's, it's a weird song it's not it's not a boy girl song it's uh <laughs> it's got the governor of alabama in it and it's got putting down neil young, neil young and, yeah and it talks about the session uh, musicians in uh and muscle shoals alabama yeah. it's like how does the public in america gonna hook onto this think it's uh eh, all that doesn't matter <laughs> yeah it's right the dominoes fall or they don't and it's really hard to tell what pushes them forward to fall yeah you know? it's, it's just really weird al cooper getting the sweet inspirations to sink uh sweet home alabama and the courses on that and the guitar solos and all the all the little things in that thing and i give al al cooper a lot of credit for that and uh but the band had already you know we got they got we got through with the first album and it was in the can to be released and everything and they wrote sweet home alabama and so oh. before the album was even released they booked the studio to come in and record just that song because they were getting such favorable response in clubs they were playing. That's interesting. And, and so I think they did it thinking, okay, the album's not released yet. Maybe we'll pull the album back and put this up. But all so many things had already taken place for the release of that first album. It was actually put in the can for the second album. That's amazing. You know, when you said that song by Starbuck, uh, Moonlight Feels Right, you know who else has done that? The guy who wrote Brandy. Yes. Uh, Looking Glass. That yeah. guy's made a whole career out of that one song. That's a I'm, I'm mixing a song for that guy right now. You're kidding me. <laughs> That's like one of the greatest songs ever. I, that was such a cool song. I remember just listening to that. Yeah. I still listen to it over and over, man. It's a great song. Yeah, so, so friends of mine and everything has gotten involved with, the, with him uh, at the uh, at Kennesaw State University in Atlanta, and uh, and somehow or another he wound up recording this song and did it for this girl and everything. It's kind of like so they knew me real well, and uh, they sent the song to me, and so we're now we're going back and forth, you know, That's... with uh, me mixing and and uh, his suggestions and everything, which make a lot of sense, and still a very talented guy. How random is it that I mentioned that song and you're working on it? <laughs> I mean, just think of that. That's pretty weird. Isn't well, it? Like, of all the songs it, it, out there, you're like, oh, I'm working on it. It is weird. Yeah. And especially the, that's the only huge hit they had. I, I yeah. Well, great. But, you know, I know Leslie West just passed, but I had um, a guy named Rich Eckhart. He's Toby Keith's guitar player in Nashville. Real good guy. And he told me he was uh, opening or something for Leslie one day. And uh, they were talking backstage and something about writing a song. And 
Leslie said, you only need one. (laughs) (laughs) So there you go, man. It happens a lot. Yes. Uh, I want to talk to you about some of the artists you've worked with. And man, I could spend hours on this. You've had such a great career, but for each one of them, if you could tell me how you found, how you wound up hooking up with them. And if you have any cool or interesting stories about working with them and let's talk about Augusta, Georgia, James Brown. Oh gosh, man. That's one of my favorite stories. Oh, that's cool. Okay. And 66, uh, I'm still playing in the band. I've got a brand new uh, Pontiac GTO convertible. Oh, and, good, uh, nice car. And, and my wife and I, we're dating. Uh, not, we're not married at that point, but but uh, James Brown's performing in '66 over in Jekyll Island, Georgia. Yeah, yeah. I know. And it's a little uh, uh, center there. They think they use for conventions and, and stuff like that. So we decided to go see James Brown, and we get there, and it's kind of like right down the center of the of the room. It's white people on one side <laughs> and black people on the other side. That's funny, and, man. And I, that show blew me away because uh, once the whole show started, there was three different acts. It never stopped. The music never stopped. The, he had two drummers, two bass players, and two guitar players, and they alternated. Like one drummer plays for so many songs, and he gets kind of stand up, and the other drummer sat down and play for so many songs. It never wow. stopped, and it was a. So the last thing was that the Flames played and everything, the performed and everything, and then they did the intro for the hardest working man in show business, James Brown. So he comes on stage, and he is he is at the top of his game. <laughs> what a performer, man! What, what a, performer. a performer! He's doing all those turns and drops and catch, throwing the mic out and catching, bringing it back to him, and it's it's like we're just blown away, and um, I still no i will never forget that night and everything and uh so that's 66 and 68 at 69 james brown has booked lefevre sound oh wow <laughs> to record one song uh and so the preamble to the session was he sends a he sends a uh, group of guys in before this way before the session kind of like the president's crew that goes in and kind of like <laughs> tells everybody what to do and how that everything's supposed to go down. That was exactly that. You're ki- like, Mr. Brown's going to come in, make sure you say this, make sure he's got a coffee ready or something like that. It was, uh, when, uh, when Mr. Brown comes in, you do not speak to him unless he speaks to you <laughs> and you don't call him James. Don't call him anything, but Mr. Brown. Wow. And, and he, uh, and he'll do this thing live with the man and everything. And you only really only usually does one take and that's it. So make sure you got your act together and it's just sure you got your act together. So I'm sitting there, I'm scared to death. Yeah. Because, you know, by far and away, it's the biggest, uh, person I'd uh, recorded at that time, the idea of it. And, uh, so the preparation for, you know, the, the musicians all get there, everybody in his band and everything. James Brown goes out there. Mr. Brown goes out there. <laughs> he sits down with the guitar player to start with. And it's just kind of just this thing over and over and over. And the name of the song is, uh, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. I'll open the door and get it myself. Okay. <laughs> Maybe in competition for the world's longest title for a song. Yeah, man. I'm going to, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. I got to look that up. I want, I can get up. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, I'll he, open the he door. Must have been sm- smoking crack when he thought well, of that. <laughs> but he's with the guitar player. The guitar player starts this thing. He goes to the drummer. Drummer starts playing this beat. He goes to the bass player, and then the horn section is standing over there. I, I can't remember. It's like four guys, and so I'm got microphones on everybody, you know. And all this is going on. It's just kind of like, you know, hour turns People. into two how hours many, how many people was that were in like how, how big was this band well we didn't record organ and there was only one guitar player so i'd say it was probably six to seven people and then there was him he did the live vocal track to everything so i had plenty of time hmm. without each musician 
telling them to play so and so as they were kind of rehearsing all this stuff i could get all the sounds everything and so i i dialed yeah. in all the sounds there i felt pretty good about it and everything and so he finally uh get ready to record you know and he says uh okay let's do it and so i hit record on the tape machine and they go through the whole song and everything. And it's one of the songs, I think the first minute and a half of the song, they're only on one chord change. All right. And so when he raises his hand, they go to the next chord change. <laughs> right. The horns got horns come in at that chord change. That's the first time you hear the horns a minute and a half goes by. So the record everything, a song and everything. So I uh, get through with it. And Mr. Brown says, let me come in and listen to it. So he comes in the control room. So I play the thing back and everybody's grooving and everything. And it was cool and everything. Craig, when it gets to the chord change, there are no horns. Oh my God. So it's kind of like, I look, back, I look back at the tape machine and they're supposed to be on track six and track six, the needle needles is not moving. And, um, uh, so go, and he turns and he looks at me and he says, where are my horns? <laughs> where are my horns? <laughs> oh my God. I, I said, and I went, I said, just a minute. So I went back to the machine. And so the night before I'd done this cross patch thing on the back of the tape machine to get some echo delays and all this stuff. And the input cable into track six never got pushed all the way in. Oh my God. So I had to sit there and say, Mr. Brown, we don't have them. You and must have been scared to death. I was. I said, you know, can I get a job back in the tobacco patch? This, <laughs> this, this is going to be the end of it. <clears throat> and oh, without uh, without hesitation, he didn't say anything, but let's do it again. And oh uh, God, how relieved were you? I was like, I was still scared to death. You know, <laughs> like, cause I, all that time getting sound and everything, I saw the meter on the console, but I never thought to look around and look at the meters on the tape machine sure this, this time i made sure everything was going everything so they did it again and it and i tell everybody it's kind of like the first time the band had had a break when they got through with that first take so it's kind of like when they got a kind of a, a break and everything so let's do it again they actually did it as good or if not better the second time and not was not one of those things that Man, this is all right, but man, we lost the best tape we ever could ever do on that. It wasn't that. It was kind of like it was good. Oh, and, uh, that's great. I had ever tape. I had ever tape machine running. We had in the control. <laughs> you must have been like exhausted of stress and worry after that session, man. Oh, it was. It was kind of like you know. It's kind of like that was a big responsibility. It, uh, yeah. And I only mentioned engineering for a year. You know, it's kind of like. And I've got no assistant engineers. I got nobody running out there and changing microphones and doing this. I mean, Maurice gave me that job. He uh, hit the office. <laughs> well, hey, at least you were smart enough not to say, Mr. Brown, I've only been doing this for a year. <laughs> Imagine what all kind of hell would have broke loose if you would have told him that. Man, oh but that, that was the kind of the worst nightmare and the wow. most relief I've ever had in one session. And That's you know, amazing. That, I got to look up that song. I I don't I want don't nobody give me nothing. Right. I'll open up the door and get it myself. I'll open it. Wow. I'm going to check that. I think that that's, that I think that's it. And it was a, how, what, how, they, they must've had like a, a 78 to play. How do you fit that on a label? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they, they probably said, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. And in parentheses. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's funny, man. Wow. What was, so, uh, as far as the performance goes, like watching him, was it like watching art being created? Cause the guy's so talented. It was, it was the, you know, it's kind of like, and he had had total control of that whole band just in the palm of his hand. They, it was always, and I've watched all the live performances and everything. It's kind of like the band kind of knows what's going on. They know the songs real well, but they better be on the lookout because if he uh, gives a signal to them, they better be able to uh, adapt to it. He was just like totally in control. I think, uh, you know, we did the, the version with him singing and then for the, uh, for the B side of the record, I don't think the band played again. He went over to the organ and played a uh, instrumental track with That's him play with him playing organ 
in studio LaFever Sound owned didn't own a cool thing like a B3 Hammond organ. We had a Baldwin church organ. <laughs> um, and so he went and played he on jammed, the Baldwin jammed on the Baldwin <laughs> organ. What was that? I'd like to check. I didn't know he even played keyboards. He played at keyboards. Okay. He played at keyboards. Gotcha. That's so cool, man. What a great story, man. Thank you for that is awesome. Yeah, that was that was a momentous occasion. All right. Let's talk about the Winstons. They had a hit called Color Him Father. It was one of your early mixes that you worked on. A great song. And the record was, I thought. I was, I'd assume I'm just a few years behind that, but I'd assume that was a pretty bold record lyrically for the times. It was because yeah. it uh, addressed the fact that uh, this was somebody that uh, had a person in their life was not the real father, but uh, he totally took the place of his real father. And he, uh, was in the songs about him, uh, uh, recognizing that. And, uh, and it was, it was different and everything, but it was R and B song of the year. Great, it's a great song, man. And uh, and that was uh, the band came in to record that one song because he, had Richard Spencer, who had just passed away recently, they wrote that song and everything. He had the band, the Winstons, and everything. Uh, and so they'd played that song, and some people had heard it there in Atlanta, and some people I know that had kind of gotten together and got the band to come down and record that song. So and it's kind of like recognize that was this could be a hit record, even though it was not your normal R and B song. It wasn't about the blues. It was a, like a real story, something uh, something that really uh, pertained to real people. It's very. It was a very moving record lyrically. Yeah. So so you thought that would be a hit right there after you recorded it. Well, the it just so happens I knew all the people around that was involved in it. Uh, okay. One of the guys, Johnny B, was my ex-manager when I was in the band. Okay. And, and there was a record promotion guy that I knew real well, uh, Wendell Parker. He was part of that the thing. And then Don Carroll, who was the uh, producer on the thing that I'd known and got, got to know him real well. He was the producer on it. So I kind of knew everybody, and it's kind of like everybody was thinking before we go on, this is a hit song. So it's kind of like I thought pretty well this might be – a pretty big hit song too and it, you gotta remember this is 1969 also and uh and it just seemed like uh i did a lot of stuff in 1969 <laughs> starting off well, what uh, a, we did that we, by yeah. the way we did that early in 69 so we just had a four track for that record that's it that's i don't and i tell people the story i said you know we recorded the band the rhythm section and everything and it was like on one or two tracks and then the, we bounced those two tracks down to one track and then added some overdubs vocals and so we got it to, all down to the final thing and we had one track open we'd opened up one track everything else was had all this stuff all over them so we invited uh, there there was a string section that came in of like seven or eight string players there was a horn section they came in like four to five guys and we had four background singers Holy in, smokes. A, in, a, in a vocal booth. And one of the background singers played tambourine behind their back. <laughs> that's amazing. And it all, all that went down on one track on one. That's amazing, man. And so it's kind of like, you got to get a blend on this. When he gets to the chorus, when everybody's playing, you can't separate the vocals out, background vocals out from the horns or the strings. It's all there. And to this day, when I hear that record, I just, I don't know how we did it. The fact what is great training. Well, I that mean, was the only way that's why you did things back then. It's yeah. kind of like you had to make those commitments on thing and everything. Of course, there were things like, you know, somebody messed up in the course. They one of the, uh, background singers didn't hit their note, right? Well, we had to start at back at a point where nobody was playing or singing and go forward from there or go back to the top of the whole song and start over because you couldn't fix their thing outside of uh, yeah. a track. And, uh, it wasn't until later on, I got to think about how complicated a process was that Yeah, to make that scene sound like it's not complicated. 
<laughs> yeah, that's incredible that you did all that. I mean, that's like the whole kitchen, everything in the, but the kitchen sink in there and the kitchen sink rather. Yeah. Uh, talk about now the B side to that track. Yeah. And for the, for anybody listening who doesn't know, again, the, the, the band was the Winstons. The, the A side was Color Him Father, one R&B song of the year. But the B side was Amen Brother. Okay. And uh, there's an eight bar drum fill in there that has since become the most sampled drum riff in the history of music, primarily a lot in the rap genre, but talk, right. talk about that. And I read, I read about it. The, the drummer kind of had a sad life. He sort of fell yeah. into obscurity and uh, passed away homeless or broke or something. Yeah, he know. never, never really got any notoriety too much or compensation for that. That break beat was kind of sold and put on so many records and everything. And, uh, and towards the end, he got some recognition and there was some money gotten together for him, a little bit of money, but, uh, but how that song happened, it was a song the band played live. Okay. So after we recorded uh color and father, there was no more original songs. That was it. <laughs> Richard Spencer sat down and wrote that one song. And it's kind of like, that was the impetus for the whole thing. You know, we got a single. Okay. So the single's got a B side. It's got to be a different song. So he's sitting there like, oh my God, I need a B side right now. I need a B side, B side. So finally, I think it was Johnny B, my ex manager. He's in the control room. He says, he said, why don't y'all do that tune that I heard y'all play live the other night? That's kind of uh, instrumental. And it's kind of like, and because uh, they'll do, they said, yeah, we do that every night with play and everything. So it's basically one of those things where they went out there and it's kind of like, I've been asked so many times exactly how i mic the drums what kind of microphones i use on the drums what kind of processing and all this stuff and it's kind of like i didn't know any of anything about this break we recorded that song it's kind of like one take done over with put leader tape on it it's that's done and uh and about 10 years ago maybe nine or ten years ago this guy called me out of clear blue and he says uh is this Rodney Mills? I said, uh, yes. He said, are you the guy that uh, engineered the uh, color and father by the Winston's? I said, yeah, and I think I'm thinking it's pretty cool. Somebody kind of recognizes that song. He says, Mr. Mills, said, do you know the significance of the B side of that record? I said, I can't even remember the B side of the record. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of, and he, so he said, uh, could I interested? Could I interest you in uh, allowing me to come down and interview you? Do an interview with you on that uh, song? He said, "I don't want you to try to listen to that song ahead of time." He said, "I'm gonna bring down uh, some uh, material to play for you and everything." And uh, and so so he made an appointment and everything. And so uh, to come down, of course, I, the curiosity got me, and uh, so I looked it up on the internet, and it was amen brother and it's kind of like so there's the song was and i, I remembered it uh instantly after I, I heard that and everything so he come down came down with a um guy did a video and a guy that uh a couple of kids that were working in this uh genre of music called jungle and uh, the only piece of music they worked with in the jung jungle genre is that eight bars break in uh amen amen brother they only work with that in sampling cutting it up and make it sound different speeding it up slowing it down taking the end of trying to get the individual and it's so he played me 50 something recordings that had that beat in there Holy some of them some of them i had no idea they were in there once that was pointed out to me it that beat is so identifiable once you hear it and everything and uh and so he also brought a guy he also brought a guy that was like a scientist and this guy had had figured out the uh fundamental frequencies of everything in that eight eight measure thing even the cymbals the snare drum the kick drum and everything and he, and he started explaining how this one frequency supported this frequency and it's kind of like God, th thankfully you don't have to do that to actually make good music you know it's like but yeah it's kind of like surprised me like this this was that big a deal and, yeah and uh and it, and it's kind of like 
So at the end of the thing, he says, what do you think is going to be your, your uh, legacy of, of uh, <laughs> sweet, home, sweet Home Alabama or, uh, or the uh, Amen Break? <laughs> I, said, I said, I don't know. I said, I've been living with Sweet Home Alabama for a long time. The Amen Break is it's it all new to me. Yeah. And it's kind of like, and since then, I, you know, I, I'd mention it to people, my clients have come in and everything. And every one of them, you know, it's like, Oh yeah. They may break. Yeah. They're, you know, they all, all knew about it and everything. You know? Have you, have you ever had to re master re-engineer or remaster one of your clients using the amen break? Yes. So a few of them. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. They, the, the, they didn't probably know you engineer the original. No. They, and after, and some of my clients, you know, that when I first started the mastering stuff, there was a little bit of, uh, uh, I don't know, kind of question mark about whether, uh, Rodney Mills could uh, actually do this rap, rap music to stuff and everything. So, so it's kind of like after I kind of got going in and I, and then this happened several years ago from then on, I was kind of like people I'd never worked with before. And I always said, y'all ever heard this thing called amen break. And they say, Oh yeah. I said, you know, I recorded that back in 1969 and they look at me like, <laughs> that's instant credibility now not that, that, yeah no, seriously that wipes away any question mark anybody we're had good to go. that, we're good we're good to go now <laughs> yeah yeah no seriously that's like landmark stuff man that's really cool i cannot believe the success you had early on like that that's like you couldn't have scripted that there was a lot of uh music going on in atlanta <laughs> and to be associated with one of the uh, top three studios in there and then 69 it's like started working there full time, 68, 69, beginning or even before 1970, buddy Bowie hmm. changed studios where he worked at, did all his recording. He was the guy that wrote spooky okay, and stormy and traces for the classics four back in the sixties. And so buddy was, uh, affiliated with bill Lowry and, uh, in Atlanta there and had, they had a publishing company together and bill had a studio recording studio. So buddy, had recorded all those songs at that, that studio. Well, he had a falling out with the owner of that studio and he came over to, uh, to a uh, Lefebvre sound. And he's, and after we'd done a couple of things together, he says, I'm going to do all my recording over here from now on. So after he'd been over there and went several months and everything, he said, Rodney, I got this idea that I want to build my own studio. He said, I spent so much time and so much money in a studio here. I could build a studio. And, uh, would you uh, be interested in, uh, in building the studio and being the engineer for me? And I said, cause at that point I loved the sessions I did with him. It was musicians. I knew guitar players, bass players, drummers, and it was the cream of the crop there in Atlanta and everything. And I said, if I could do this on a consistent basis, this is what I want to do. And to be honest with you, I'd just gone previous to that being offered to me, I'd just gone to my boss, Maurice. So I was working nonstop seven days a week. Yeah. I said, Maurice, is there any way I can make any more money? Cause I didn't get any bonuses, no, no overtimes or anything like that. He said, and Maurice was a great talker. And by the end of the, my little session with him, there, begging for more money. And I came out of there thinking, you know, I'm lucky to be working for this man. That's a good salesman, man. That's a great sales dude. <laughs> why, why in the world would I be asking for more? Trying to positioning around. Oh man. So when he did that, and then it was like literally a week or so later, buddy offered me that, uh, that thing and, uh, the, and then, and we discussed money and everything and it was more money. And it's yeah. kind of like, so, so I had to go back to Maurice and say, I'm decided to take this job. I'll be here for several months cause we're going to build a studio, but, uh, he said, well, well, doc, they always called everybody doc. And he says, uh, what if I doubled your salary <laughs> and I'd already given buddy my word. Yeah, and it's yeah. kind of like Maurice, I can't do it. I'm, I'm going to have to go. And that, that was one of the better decisions I ever made. As far as I know, I don't know what, what I would, would have done if I would have stayed there, but certainly when I had the opportunity to build a recording studio for somebody at the age of 22 or 23, it, uh, it was, it was quite a task and everything, but, but how cool is that? You're building a studio to your specs Mary, based on your, I mean, Mary and I, my wife, 
we had to go downtown Atlanta to the library and me check out some books on acoustics and stuff like that. And fortunately, when I was working for Maurice Lefebvre, he built a whole new addition to the studio, which was a full blown studio, like 20 foot ceilings. Uh, it was like 50 something feet deep and it had all these polycyndric polycyndrical diffusers in the thing. And I was able to look at the plans and look at all this stuff and see how you, so when I took that job on, I kind of had a little bit of an idea about it and everything. And, uh, and I had a friend of mine who was a carpenter okay. and a painter painted houses. Okay. I said, Shaq, Shaq was his stage name. <laughs> and I said, Shaq, you're going to, uh, get a crew together and help me build this uh, recording studio. And uh, we agreed to it and everything. And, uh, and, uh, and it was kind of like one of those things that's kind of like, okay, this is what I want to do. we got to figure out how to do it. We didn't go to an architect or anything. We just started building out the studio in this open space in this uh, warehouse complex and got through the thing. And actually, you know, we, uh, 1970, we uh, opened the doors to that place and started recording in there. And that was kind of where I did the kind of remainder of my Atlanta based uh, recordings and everything was done in that one studio. And that became one of the biggest and most successful studios in Atlanta at, at the time. Yeah. Southern Southern rock took off it's really started doing well. Yeah. Atlanta rhythm section had actually formed out of the group of uh, session players that buddy Bowie used on all his recordings. Okay. Uh, and so at the end of sessions, they just stick around the studio and jam for a while and it just instrumental stuff like that. So I got, that's where I got to play them with those cables on the, on the thing cause the created delay on the guitar. I'd have to take the playback on one track and feed it into another and get the slap back on the guitar and everything and kind of create this mood stuff. And I could do enough of it. I could kind of control the feedback and everything. And so we did this stuff, you know, and but buddy, put a singer on one of the songs and everything. And they sent it off to a record company and, and it got signed. That was the, during the tenure there at uh, Lefebvre sound. So we built studio one We they had gotten a record deal and we did completed the first album at studio one. So yeah. everything really worked out in every way possible there. So it was, it was like the, you know, I, when I see things like this, it's like the universe was supporting every bit of your decision to do this. One of the, you know, like you say, you know, I, and I say it a lot to people. I say, you know, you're going to get chances in your life where you come to a point where you've got to make a decision to go one way or go another. I said, and at some time, and I think it's totally by chance, you make a decision and it's the perfect decision yeah. later on that you can look back on. Or <laughs> you could decide to go this other way and nobody ever hears of you again. Yeah. And it's just fortunate that when you get to that point, make sure you do everything you can do to make the right decision. And sometimes it's like, okay, so you get getting a little bit of notoriety. That's all these managers come out of the wall works, you know, and they want to be your manager. And I've seen so many acts get tied up with the wrong people that yeah. it kind of ruins their career. But, uh, yeah, studio one was, I lived ate and breathed in that studio with no, really no influences of working in any other studios really other than uh, Lefebvre sound. Capricorn was out of Atlanta, weren't they? Nope. Out of Macon. Out of Macon. Did they funnel work? It's not close. I know that, but did they funnel work over there? It being such a big successful studio. They, uh, there again, they were on with Almond brothers and everything and uh, several acts and everything. Uh, <clears throat> Marshall Tucker, uh, they had it going down in Capricorn also, and I don't know how to, how much I should divert from the story here, but the Alma brothers are doing really well. And I get a call from Dickie Betts. You get a call. I get a call from Dickie Bett because in 1968, right after Mary and I got married, I got this call from a friend of mine to go down to Jacksonville and record this band that had Dickie Betts and Barry Oakley in it. And Barry Oakley was in Atlanta. I'd done all these sessions with Barry Oakley and he played in a band with the, and the Romans and I knew him really well and everything. So, so I said, wow, that'd be great. We're going to go down there and record a couple of songs. So we go down to Jacksonville and record two songs, uh, with a uh, Dickie Betts band. Uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of it now. It was um, 
pre Almond Joys. This was, and this is pre Almond Brothers. Pre Almond. So was, this was Dickie's so Almond thing. Joy, Almond Joys were when I was playing in a band. The Almond Joys were out then. Dickie was not in, even known by them. Okay. And, uh, Second Coming was the name of uh, right. Dickie. Second Coming. Yeah. And so they were banned down in Jacksonville, and and so I didn't know Dickie, but I knew uh, Barry Oakley real well. And so we go decide to okay, we go down to Jacksonville. We basically make nothing. And I'll sit there in that little studio, which was a converted gasoline station. <laughs> and for two days, two days, Mary sat in the little control room with me and everything. And we recorded two songs with the second coming. And uh, so we didn't make any money. So about 15 years ago, 12, 13 years ago, they decided to put the great, the Alma brothers anthology album together. Mm -hmm. We get a call about those two songs that were recorded with Dickie Betts. That's that dreams package. Correct. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. I think yeah. so. Yeah. And it's, and in that thing is, uh, they make us an offer of $30,000 for those two songs. And I'm going to tell everybody something that it's too late now to do anything about it, but the, uh, Universal, whoever had signed the project that released this uh, anthology and everything, wanted to buy the masters from us. So my friend that went down to Jacksonville with me and everything, he says, "Right, now, we don't have a tape copy or a master of this thing." He says, "I've got a few of the vinyl records that were released that uh, not been played." He said, "I'm going to take these things to transcribe them to tape, put some leader <laughs> tape on them." <laughs> I probably should not have said this, <laughs> but we got 30 hey, so st bucks. statute of limitations. Is yeah, I've got sorry. to be right. <laughs> nobody, nobody's ever said, you know, that, uh, anything to the effect, like this sounds like a, a record, a 45 RPM record. That's what it was, but that's all we had. I do have in my storage at my house in Atlanta, I have run across a couple of tape copies of that original session that, uh, I could not find at that time. Hey, for whatever it's worth, I've listened to that many times. That whole set, it sounds great. And and it, and, and when it sounds less quality, I listen to it. I'm like, well, it's 1969, and what the, you know, it, they didn't have the technology, and these guys probably didn't have the money, even if they had the technology. I mean, they weren't oh. recording in in L.A. with you know something and, like uh, that. Thing about second coming, Dicky Bass, they had no original songs. Yeah, we did two covers. That's and, great, uh, man. And Dickie's wife played uh, keyboards on it. Uh, Barry Oakley <laughs> was on it. I, don't know who, I can't remember who played drums on it. I know it wasn't Butch Trucks, but uh, but it was on that at that time where it was kind of like 68, and we got into 69, 70, and all of a sudden, 70, Alma Brothers start really breaking out. And, uh, and so it's kind of like Studio One was at the right place at the right time, and Roddy had made a really good decision because it took us a while at Studio One to get rolling with yeah. everything and uh li literally we were depending on atlanta rhythm section making an album about once every year or a year and a half to kind of pay for things because we got a budget to record all this stuff and some and al cooper new york guy he decides to come down to atlanta he had gotten a deal with uh with uh mci records to to have him to have his own label okay uh, sounds of the south okay and he signed two bands one of them being leonard skinner and the other band uh mose jones and uh mose jones never made it but skinner right out of the box it's you know the first album everything they get through the album they decided to sign management with i cannot remember his name now but he was the guy was in charge of the who uh uh tour manager for the who stadium tour okay in the united states so he said we'll get let leonard skinner can open up for the who for the who and they wound up pretty much blowing the who off stage that's because, almost so, unbelievable that's because they were playing they were playing free bird at that time and uh and and it just became such it's nobody had ever seen or heard anything quite like that guitar yeah. playing and stuff like that that was just extraordinary at that time it, to it me it really was and to me it's kind of like you know okay you were there and you worked on a pretty 
pretty good bit of stuff on that first album. Not everything by any means, but uh, you were privy to what's going down on this album. It's kind of like, it's kind of like I listened to uh, Freebird, and it's kind of like, wow, this is a long song. It's a long song. I, it really gets you going, and it's great. But who is going to play this? Not thinking, you know. It's kind of like that was the beginning of the time when radio didn't necessarily have to play it. There were all radio stations that would play at, uh, adult-oriented uh, rock. FM started coming out then. And they, yes. Yeah, that's what saved a lot and of bands would, like that, I bet. And so bands didn't have to have a hit song, and that even gets up really to the 38 Special stuff. 38 Special were perceived to be a rock and roll band, but they were a kind of a pop band. So it was kind of like, I, th I think that was... That was the uh, magic of what we did together was finding a formula that worked on both sides. Uh, that did, they definitely didn't copy uh, Skinner, even though they were totally intertwined. Yeah. But uh, just uh, an Atlanta rhythm section in 76 finally hit it. And so that was a, that was a d deal to me. I'd done everything with them up until that point. And we, uh, work on this album and uh it's got the song in it so into you great song. And, uh, and it's kind of like it's a really good song but we had other songs i haven't thought was really good too but during the latter part of that uh when we're finishing up the album and everything i uh pressed uh buddy Bowie and his wife gloria let's get this uh new thing called a harmonizer and I said, you know, Ronnie Hammond's having to do all these harmony parts and everything. I'm in my dumb way of thinking. I said, we're going to be able to get this thing. We save some time and effort and everything. I just dialed the harmony to a thing and, 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 and it'll be take place. Well, that didn't work. So, so it's kind of like one day and I'm fooling around with the mix on so into you. And I had the harmonizer to the Dean Daltrey's, uh, Warlitz or keyboard electric piano. And just instead of trying to harm, I find a harmony, just I detuned it just a little bit. And it was kind of, like, what is this sound? And it was kind of like, and then it, I don't, I don't know where's the mix or everything we'd done, but that automatically just kind of like made that song go to the front. Of and everything you did that. on the that's so cool. That, that's got to be like a pretty good feeling. Well, and something that's a little bit of inspiration, you know, uh, or whatever it is and everything, it, it d does happen you know you make a contribution to something you feel like you have made a comp contribution something when something like that happens and everything yeah. the song to be released and we were so used to releasing all these albums and singles that were mediocre at the best and uh and the band really didn't tour that much you know we release an album we'd go out and do a tour to support the album and everything and it kind of nothing really happened we'd go back in the studio and and I was, session, were they still playing sessions? Even yeah, though, they were still okay. playing, playing sessions. Yeah. And I was, uh, so when they, when they went out for the uh, album promotional tour and everything, I went out too and mixed front of house. Oh, man, that had to be nice. Because uh, I knew every note they played. Yeah, yeah. Who better to mix it than you? And so that kind of like con that. I, I didn't ask for the job to go out. But because the people that own the studio were the people that, managed the Atlanta rhythm section, produced the Atlanta rhythm section, published all the songs and they paid my salary. So Rodney, you need to go out and mix from the house. So, but I, so I'd done that on the previous albums and everything. So when that album came out and, and that single was doing so well, we started uh, being on the road 20 something days a month, which is, that's a lot. Plus you got to come back. Plus you got to come back and mix studio stuff when i get in the studio get back home it's not like rest it's go straight to the studio and work on because they're still paying me a part of salary at studio one and atlanta rhythm section is paying paying me a salary yeah. so together i'm kind of doing okay not doing great but i'm doing okay i'm doing okay yeah and so i'll just kind of like cut to the chase of this my life story so uh so into you and the line rhythm section is doing really well. And Skinner just started street survivors down in Miami, Florida, criteria studios. Mm. And, uh, and not thinking anything about it. Uh, so I'm on the road and all through, so I'm kind of hearing what's going on. Kevin Elson 
who worked for Skinner was the front of house mixer for Skinner from the very beginning. He, uh, goes down to Miami after the group had been down there recording some and everything. So he came down, he said, the, the group said, let's play you some of the stuff we've been doing. And Tom Dow was producing the album and everything. So I don't think he was in the control room when Kevin heard this stuff for the first time, but they played Kevin two or three songs and they said, uh, what do you think, Kevin? He says, I think it's the worst sounding stuff I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, and they're like, what? And he says, you guys, you need to go back up to Atlanta, Georgia, studio one, where you started and get Rodney Mills to engineer your album. So it's like that. So they were kind of in favor of that. So he, and, he, he, he wasn't saying the songs were bad. He said the way they got put together and recorded was bad. The sounds on the, and drum sounds were not good. Wow. Some drum sounds were not good. So Kevin calls me up and he says, Rodney, I've got to talk the band into, let me make some safeties of uh, two or three songs on 24 track. And, uh, at that time we were still 16 track. Okay. 16 tracks. So he had to, he had to actually combine some stuff and he says, Artemis Powell and I going to fly to Atlanta. Then we'll bring the tapes out and everything. And we'll have Artemis to replay the drums over the top of some of the two or three songs and make a rough mix on. So they fly up and, uh, Artemis plays Robert Nix, who is the drummer for the Atlanta rhythm section drums are in the studio they don't fly Artemis old drum kit up so I, i'm very comfortable getting a sound on robert's drums because that's what i did all the time and so artemis overdubbed drums on those three songs and we uh made a rough mix on them. I, I made as good a mix as i could possibly make and uh so kevin and uh, artemis get on a plane go back to miami and uh, they play them for the band and so ronnie van zant so that's it or go, we're going to Atlanta. Wow. So how did, uh, like where you have, I don't know how this works. Was there any concern of yours that basically, man, I'm going to piss Tom Dowd off. That might not really be a good career move or, or it is, or it is not, not relevant here. No, I think the deal was Tom did not want to come to Atlanta. He okay. was, and he was very comfortable there in uh, criteria, but he had, he had let a, like an intern type engineer get sounds and, uh, okay. And, and it, so, uh, it was not, not happening. And, uh, the deal was, okay. So, so the Atlanta rhythm section with that hit and everything. And in the period we're that, uh, Artemis, was kind of, Artemis comes up and, uh, and overdubs the drums and everything. We buy all new equipment for the studio. Oh, we get a 24 track. We get a Harrison 32, thir uh, 32 console. We get all new speakers. We get everything and everyone. And it says, so the conversation was, you know, that, uh, we were just a 16 track studio. No, we became a 24 track studio and based on the fact they wanted to come up and record. So that, that process was already going on anyway. Right. So I'm on the road 20 something days a month. And real and all this is kind of getting put together and everything. And so I'm picking equipment for the console, the tape recorders for all the outboard gear that we're going to uh, purchase for the thing. And, and, and Skinner kind of knows we're doing that. Tom Dowd, he knew MCI consoles, but he did not know Harrison console. And, um, so all that comes about. So the big decision, another major decision in my life, Craig came with me going out on the road with the Atlanta rhythm section, becoming tour manager, road manager for the Atlanta rhythm section, which means I settled up with all the promoters. I checked the venues out, made sure all the, uh, the, uh, trays, the liquor, the sick cartons, the cigarettes and everything was for everybody. Get the bands to the airport, get them boarding passes, find them in the bars, get them to the hotels, get their luggage checked in, book their rooms and do everything, go to the gig, find out when we do a sound check, come back and get the band. Go. It, it was more work. It was like being in the tobacco field again. That's what I'm thinking. You would have been better off being in the tobacco. I'm killing myself out there, you know, and plus, kind of, plus you were coming back and doing mixing at studio yes, one and doing work there and doing work there. And it's kind of like, okay. So I said, 
and Skinner wanted me to engineer their record. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, one second, normally too, I would imagine the process of basically having someone write a blank check and you picking up all that's a fun process. It's like someone saying, Hey man, just pick some guitars out to a guitar player. Right. right. But under all this stuff with everything else you had done, I, I would imagine that sort of the joy of that got taken away in a, in a sense, because this is all like extra work for you too. Well, it was a, just, a, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of hats to play. Plus, you know, I'd go out and we'd go out for like two weeks and I got, took all the money in that sometimes it was cash. Sometimes it was checks and, and I was doing daily expenses out to the band and every per diems and stuff and all like that. And at the end of two weeks, I had to check up to the penny back home. That's a lot of work, man. That's a, that alone is a lot of work. So when we got, so the thing came, I said, I got to stop this thing on the road. So I, I told buddy and Gloria Bowie, I said, I'm going to come back in the studio and do this album with Skinner and, uh, and that, you know, the reason we're getting the Skinner thing is because of the sex success we just had on the Atlanta rhythm section album. And that's why Skinner's coming back. Plus the fact that they, the had, demos. Great, they had great success at studio one. And, um, uh, and, um, uh, so they cut my salary off from being on the road, which was $200 a week. And my studio at, uh, I think my studio one salary oh my was 250. So they're coming back to 250. So they cut your salary in and, half. Uh, but I went in, really, I went in with the band, a lot of apprehension, Tom Dowd coming in. Tom Dowd comes in, he's like, he's like a, uh, a genius scientist that's got soul. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you and, say that. Uh, and he sits down at the console and he starts going through the, all this stuff, testing the console out and doing all this stuff. And you know, and I haven't done enough work on the console to kind of like, I feel totally comf comfortable with it. And so here's Tom, he's kind of like making these notes to himself and all, all this stuff. And, and so we go ahead with the commencement of, uh, doing, taking the stuff that was started in Miami, finishing that up, cutting some new tracks. And then, uh, the deal was that Tom Dowd was going to mix the album because that was the deal. Tom Dowd produced and he still, he didn't necessarily engineer everything, but he mixed the albums, whoever he was producing. And because of the original stuff had done a criteria and those mixes they had made and that Kevin Elson heard, they didn't sound good. So Ronnie Van Zant, he basically says to me, he says, Rodney, you're going to mix this album. And says, uh, we really love the way that record sounded with ARS and, and we want you to mix this record. So. Well, plus the demos you had just done with Artemis that like kind of like sealed the deal. Well, they wouldn't be what there. Happened, what happened? We're in the midst of cutting that album and Tom there's a couple of songs that kind of get semi finished. Uh, so Tom starts doing kind of like final mixes on them. And it's kind of like, I'm sitting there and listening to it and it says, this stuff sounded pretty good before Tom said that to me. <laughs> good for you. And it, and it just, I, I didn't say that out loud. I'm just no, to myself right. I'm to, and I'm thinking somebody, somebody, I can't say this. Someone needs to tell him this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, so off to the side, this is a uh, uh, growing concern of the band again. And the main concern of Ronnie, Ronnie Van Zandt. So Ronnie Van Zant to the side says, Rodney, you're going to mix this album. He says, I've just got to tell Tom that he's not going to mix the album. And we're not, we're nowhere near finished with the album. It's just, but that had to come to a point because there was no sense in wasting that time. Yeah. So, so Ronnie got a, a little bit of Jack Daniels in him. And, uh, and he, I don't he didn't tell me ahead of time. It's just one night at the studio kind of he comes in the door of the studio and he starts talking to tom dowd and he says tom the work you do for us is you know it's I, there's no way we can thank you enough for what what you do and how you help the band and everything and, and he says there's other people that do good work too and one of the main reasons we came up here was take advantage of that and uh and so he went the whole thing and i'm sitting there and he's kind of like 
So I kind of get in the tape room off. The side of that. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be there for hearing that. You don't oh. want to. You don't want to see Tom's reaction as he looks over hey. to the side once he drops the bomb on. So him. I'm kind of like you know only there for part of it and everything. So what happened? There was that conversation that night. The next day, we all come to the studio except for Tom Dowd. And so Tom's not there. A couple of hours go by, he's not there. So somebody calls the, the hotel and uh, to speak with him and everything. And he said, Mr. Dowd checked out this morning. Oh, wow. He's not here anymore. He was offended. I don't know. Tom tells a distort, different story about that and everything. But the fact was, uh, he left the project and there's the band and me. And, uh, and it's kind of like, well, it's kind of like somebody in one of the guitar players said, I got this part I need to put on so, and so, and so let's just go in there and do the stuff we know we're going to do. And we just finished the album ourselves. And, you know, it sounds like Ronnie uh, approached him extremely like respectfully and tactfully. It didn't sound like he was the slightest bit like inappropriate. I mean, he was really kind. He was kind, but he was, and Al Cooper always had tremendous respect for Ronnie, not to get him too irritated. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, uh, but yes, he, uh, Ronnie didn't approach it. Like, you know, you're fired from doing this job and we're getting yeah. to do this. And, but Ronnie told me once says, it's Ronnie says, Ronnie, I'm going to tell you one thing in this band. I do all the hiring and I do all the firing. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else in the band steps up to take part in all that. Right. And it's kind of like, uh, so it was his job to kind of get that point over. And it's kind of like, you know, I didn't, I didn't, didn't at that point say, this is, wow, this is my opportunity. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to get in here and tell these guys what to play and how to do it or anything like that. No, we just kind of work together doing stuff. The back, the girls that sang backgrounds farm came in, we took, put background vocals on all the stuff. Uh, we uh, cut a new track on a song, uh, this and that, and uh, all the stuff went back and forth. And on uh, "What's Your Name," we uh, wanted to put horns on it. I said, "Well, only I know one guy that plays saxophone. He's really good." <laughs> and Jay Scott, and he came out and brought another player with him, and we stacked some tracks together and made a horn section. So in the end, Tom Dowd. It's funny it. that you say that. Those horn lines are pretty significant they're pretty stand out in that song man well there's two horn sections on there tom dowd heard the original thing that i did with a little two piece the horn section i did he said why don't you send me the tapes out here and i'll let me put a for real horn section on there so we sent the tapes out and so he uh, got a horn section to play replace the horns i did and play new parts it's not and they weren't bad or anything but he made a rough mix of it and the band was out there doing stuff for Universal, whatever at that time. And and Tom goes in to play them to see how they like the horns. And they said, We like, we like it and everything. So Tom took that as they okayed the final mix on that. And so the next thing it gets back to me is they're uh in the process of uh mastering the record. And uh this is going to be the final mix on the record, which is this rough mix that Tom did because Tom took their saying, yeah, it sounds great. They'll sound great. And I heard it. I said, I didn't know who to complain to. So I complained to their manager, right? Peter Rudge. And, uh, I said, Peter, it's right. That mix does not sound good. This is going to be the first single on the record that mix does not sound good. So they sent the tapes, they stopped everything as far as the pressing and everything and they sent the master two inch masters back to me so i made the final mix on that thing and i used part of the part of the horn section i did and part of the horn section that tom dow did that's it, it a part of me just to the ego in me i worked so hard to get the to get those horns the horns on there i said no there was a couple things they played that sounded better than what tom dow did so it was a combination of wasn't it kind of like we've got this horn section here and we got it was not separated like that. They were kind of, I fi figured out a way to uh, blend them together. That's you know? cool, man. So, wow. You know, the one thing about Skinner is the bottom line was they had great songs. Absolutely. You know, I mean, they were I mean, great. 
you, you uh, listen to the the retrospective there's just so many great songs there man and the method that uh ronnie van zandt wrote songs was unbelievable to me you know it's kind of like he just kind of like an introvert in the uh, practice room and and he kind of points out he likes this guitar riff and he likes this and and he sits over in the corner and he's writing lyrics in his head and everything and and it's kind of like you don't know what the song is melody words or anything till he finally steps up at the mic and starts singing jeff mentioned that Carlisi said that he wouldn't write anything down he never wrote anything down yeah which is unbelievable because he's yeah. got some lines it's kind of like you need to write those down no he, he remembered them uh but it's totally unique in the way that he wrote songs and all of his songs it's like jeff i still from jeff a little bit too it's kind of like you could pick any 10 of their songs and kind of hold them up against anybody almost as yeah. far as the quality of the songs and what they're saying in the songs and uh and the uh and the uh emotion that Ron ronnie uh does with the songs as far as the lyrics and everything and that's that's another thing that i'd liked about skinner is uh they you know three guitar band and everything and they all were very different from each other and i have to say that alan collins is the main guy that he knew how to uh make his guitar speak and uh it's all that ending of uh uh things we did uh, what was the song uh there's one of the songs he did and he did the solo live in the control room, which is where I did most all my guitar work. Jeff Carlisi's same way, not out in front out with a Marshall amp blowing yeah. <laughs> in the control room. And, uh, that smell Alan Collins, they played the middle solo on that thing. That's and such it, a good solo, man. We, everybody in the control room was like, and it's kind of like you heard that solo. You all wanted to cry. Yeah. It was so good. A lot, but a lot of their song, like you listen to a song like Curtis Lowe, man, you talk about emotions. I mean, that, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps now thinking about some of these tracks, you know, they're, I mean, they wrote some great songs. They really, and very moving, very emotionally powerful, man. Yes. Uh, you know, the, I worked with all three of the Van Zandt brothers and mm. uh, Ronnie was a very, the best lyricist uh, by far than um, not to say Donnie and Johnny both had uh, talent and everything. And, uh, I love working with them too. Sure. But, but Ronnie, it wasn't until that, that street survivor. So I actually got a chance to kind of like, cause we got through the album. The whole band went back to Jacksonville. Ronnie decides to stay and oversee the mixing of the album, which Kevin Elson and I did together. Okay. And, uh, and uh, I owe Kevin quite a bit and, uh, I never given him his, his props and everything, but if it wasn't for him saying, let me get Artemis, go up to Atlanta and put these drums on, they would not have, they would have probably stayed down in Miami and cut that inter whole album down there. But he did that. And, uh, and, uh, so about halfway through the mix of the album, Ronnie, <laughs> you know, we're in here to kick drum for like uh, two hours and I'm trying to <laughs> retweak it and everything. And it's kind of like, and a few days goes by, he says, I'm going home. If I stay, <laughs> I'll stay over here, I'm bored to death. That's and then we'll right. get in all kinds of trouble. So I'm going home. And so we mixed the album. Here the deal was we mixed the album. And the band's out in California doing the photo shoot for the album cover in front of that uh, fire, in front of the yeah. uh, set and everything. So I mastered this one of the few projects I did, did not master with Bob Ludwig that I mastered with, uh, I can't remember the guy's name out at Capitol records. And, uh, went, that's the first time the band heard any mixes or anything. So we make a ass state and everything. So the band's out there. So we go in this uh, executive board room at uh, universal and play the entire record for the band. And it's kind of like, well, universally it's like, a, I remember, uh, uh, Washington came and he says, there's not enough guitars on the record and everything. So, that's what I want to hear after I've worked after on you, thing. after you mix it. Yeah. So it's kind of like, okay. So I went back home and basically remixed the album by myself, you know, and, uh, and that was the final thing on the, uh, album. What happened to those original mixes? I'm not, I don't know. 
what happened to those. I'm sure that Universal found them somewhere. <laughs> it's true. Well, man, you did a hell of a job. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, you know, uh, I still listen to some of the songs on that thing and it's kind of like, wow, it's pretty cool. And, it's uh, awesome, man. That's, that's like, that, that smell pretty, is, is kind of like uh, perfect is, record. a, is a, you know, one thing is totally a down song, you know, it's not a positive song. <laughs> thing about oh, his solo in there is well, the solos and the, and the lyrics and, and, uh, and the little things we did and the mix and everything and the background singers and everything. It was, uh, it's like, no, it was not me. I didn't make that record, but I was a part of that record and I contributed to that record. And in the end, when that record was released, Tom Dow would not the, allow the record company to put his name on the record. The whole thing is really weird that he was that offended. Well, he said he didn't have final say, so the uh, final mixes, so he didn't want his name on there. And that was that was his thing. He wanted, yeah. Uh, and it's kind of like I didn't know that that had happened until I got a copy of the album. Oh, and you I, didn't see Tom? I, Dow. Looked, I looked at the credits. And it says special production, Rodney Mills. And I'm the only one that got any production credits. I'm sure he gave them his money back, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh gosh. All the records that Tom Dowd did, if he received a royalty on them, all of them, uh -oh. yeah. it had to be astronomical. But I have a feeling, you know, back in the 60s and everything, he was kind of just on uh, staff at uh, Criteria. No, at uh, Universal, at uh, not uh, for Jerry Wexler and uh, their label and everything. So they sent him down to Muscle Shoals to kind of get everything together down there. Sent him to Criteria and this stuff and that, and he's kind of doing all this stuff. Not when he, but when he started producing the Almond Brothers, yeah, he got a piece of all that. And certainly, you'd think of most of the biggest records that he did as far as rock and roll stuff and everything. Uh, Clapton, Almond Brothers. Yeah. And uh, going back to Aretha Franklin and stuff mm -hmm. like that, I have a feeling he didn't get any uh, money for that, so to speak. But uh, but there was a guy, Tom, I had the utmost respect in the world for Tom Dowd. Uh, sure. And he and I crossed paths pass again when I'm doing Greg Almond's first record down at Criteria Studios. Tom's doing an album next door. Was that weird when you saw him? Totally weird, but Tom was totally cool. Oh, that's good. That's good. He was totally cool. He was not, it was kind of like, uh, wish me the best and everything. And we talked a little bit about the Skinner record. He didn't say anything negative about that. I didn't try to go into it too deep because I didn't know how he actually stood on that. Yeah. And so I didn't want to get into that. I, I'd rather, uh, not be too confrontational with somebody if there's a possibility of that. Well, well it's just not necessary. No, no. What record have you done? And maybe it was that record that like career wise, th that's the phone was just ringing off the hook after that for you. Well, the, I have to say the Atlanta rhythm section, rhythm section. So into you, that album kind of brought uh, a lot of stuff to the forefront and uh, Southern music was doing really well and everything. And, um, and uh, after I did the Atlanta rhythm section album, you know, it's kind of like all of a sudden we're doing, we did the outlaws and I, and I engineered the outlaws record sitting next to Mutt Lane. Wow. Before he ever made it big time. The what Mutt, which outlaws record play in the wind. Was, with, the name of that, that was that with, that wasn't with green grass and high tides. Was it? No, no, yeah. that's that does after that. Yeah. I don't think there was a hit on that album, but, but bottom line on that Mutt Lane comes to Atlanta, Georgia studio one. And, uh, before and he, he was uh, Mutt Lang. Before he'd Mutt Lang, he'd only, <laughs> he'd only produced two. He would produce one album for the Boomtown Rats. Yeah, I, they were, I remember them, yeah. And he had, that was kind of his first thing. He had, then he'd produced a band up and out of Chicago, the Stanley. I can't think of the guy's last name. They'd produce a record on him because he was still doing edits on songs when he was at Studio One. And then uh, how he got the, the gig with Outlaws, I don't know, but it was kind of like, I, first time I'd sat next to a producer that, uh, Buddy Bowie, who I sat next to for 20 years, Buddy didn't play really an instrument. He could play a few chords on guitar and stuff like that. But Mutt 
could play guitar and he could sing all the little subtle things and all and the first thing like the first week we were there there were the outlaws would take the weekend off and come monday muck comes in and he passes out brand new lyrics to all the songs <laughs> all the songs change the lyrics on all the songs and, it, and it's kind of like i could tell Band must have not been too happy about that. They didn't know what to think of that. That's not what they signed on for. And but that's the way it was. But it's got Mutt was kind of like in the studio. He, you know, he played the guitar this way, played the drums this way, every instrument he kind of he had a knowledge that uh, and suggestions that were really, really good. I, and I at the end of that I said, This is the most talented guy I've worked set next to and worked with and everything and uh and so i knew Mup, i had a feeling Mutt was going to be super big and he liked me he liked me too well enough to kind of semi offer me a job and everything and it's kind of like no Mutt, i'm gonna stay here and stick it out so in the and so in the process of all that kind of going together and uh doing a few bands and then doing uh doing the land rhythm section record and then, then doing uh skinner's record and there were some records in between like you know that i engineered like uh moonlight feels right and mm -hmm. then uh, alicia bridges i love the nightlife and there was a few other things i was constantly working just working all the time and doing demos with bands and everything and all, all sorts and uh and a good friend of mine i met him in 68 guitar player john fristo and he all the time had all these songs and everything and he comes to the studio and he was the most he taught me things as an engineer. I, if you, when somebody suggests something, you say, eh, that ain't going to work. And John had all these ideas and everything to kind of push you, push you. And it's kind of like, and it would work. And you'd say, wow, I would have never come up with that. So I, I did a lot of stuff for him, uh, people that never got heard of. Uh, and then the thing with the 38 special came out because of the thing with Skinner. Talk about that. How did you hook up with those guys? Uh, Jeff, I think ran through that with you and they had done two previous albums and Jeff, when we we're doing street survivors and everything, Jeff would come out of the studio a pretty good bit. And, uh, yeah. and he got to have a chance to come out when the Atlanta rhythm section was doing some stuff out there and he got a chance to hang out and, and saw the way of work with, uh, Barry Bailey. And there's probably after Skinner, we were working on Atlanta rhythm section records. So Jeff kept kind of coming out of the studio and, and uh, because of the success of the Atlanta Rhythm Section and Skinner and everything, so Jeff, just out of, out of the clear blue, I get a call from Jeff. And um, and he says, Rodney, we, we've done two records. First record did, didn't did do real well, and then the second record didn't do well, didn't do, do anything. And so he said, we're looking to make a change. And, uh, and because the way it, uh, we liked your engineering on the couple of these records you've done and everything, we want you to engineer our next album. We hadn't found a producer yet, and uh, but we're working on that. And I don't know why I got the fortitude in me to say, Jeff, I'd love to engineer it, but I like to a shot at producing it too. And so, Jeff, I think he kind of like thought about it for just a little bit. He says, I think I'd, he said, I think that'd be a really good idea. Let me run it by the other guys in the band. So, he makes a call back to him. We call back and forth and everything. And, uh, and he says, the band wants to do it and everything. So the next step was they ran it by, uh, the record company and, uh, record company said, no way. Yeah. Cause you're a first time producer. Yeah. He says, I, we, we know the records he's engineered and everything, but, uh, he has no credentials as a producer. So Jeff and I, we said, maybe we can get buddy buoy to say, He's going to produce this record and but he just got kind of it. it and let me do it. Let me do it. And buddy wouldn't do it. And I can understand why if he wasn't going to do the work, he didn't want his name to be on there. So, so even though at that point, you know, I said, I've done all this stuff for buddy and everything. And it's kind of like, well, why can't he do this for me? And blah, blah, blah. So Jeff and I, we kind of came up with this idea of, well, why don't the, the band come to Atlanta and we uh, do some demos 
on a few songs. And uh, so I said, yeah, we could do that. I'd get in the studio, be no charge or anything like that, and and run it by the record company. And they said, no, we don't have any budget for that kind of stuff, to do any of that kind of stuff. And Jeff basically told them, well, it'll be free. Just let us do it. And so they came up, and we did three songs, I think it was. And I made mixes of them. And supposedly it were just demos, you know, and it, I worked my butt off on those things. So it was like, like an audition for producer, yeah, basically. Absolutely, Craig. Yeah, it's exactly yeah, that. And yeah. that's what it was. So it's kind of like I presented it as a thing to the record company, A&M Records, like, oh, this what is you think it, yeah, we just yeah. th threw this down last weekend in a couple <laughs> hours. And, what do you guys uh, think? <laughs> so Mark Spector, who was working the band's manager later, was their manager and everything. He was still at A&M Records, and, uh, and he got the cassettes sent up to him. And uh, listened to him, and he called Jeff and said, "This is this is the best sound of stuff you guys have ever done." Hallelujah! And so it was kind of like, on one hand, it was like it was the biggest step, one of the biggest steps that paid off. Then decisions, then uh, that I said, I always kind of like tried to put myself as trying my ambitions not exceeding my abilities. Right. And I and I always perceived my and thought of my abilities as Rodney, you're very lucky to be hanging on here. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of out front leading the pack. You're you're you do you work really hard. I work really hard and everything. And so it's kind of like my thing is I can keep up with this because of my due diligence. Your at, chops uh, trying to make this stuff everything sound as good as I can. Yeah. And uh and we made it work, made it work and recorded that first album and everything. And, and, and it, it was kind of like, and it's like Jeff already knew that, you know, him doing all his solos, he was going to do them exactly like Barry Bailey in, uh, in the Atlanta rhythm section in the control room, sitting next to me. And this thing where Jeff is coming up with all these ideas and everything. And you, he's kind of playing stuff and you kind of reinforce, you know, okay, I'll really like that. And it's kind of like we go through the song a few times, then we start putting together a track of uh, just his jam stuff to, to add to the track. And so Jeff said, make me a cassette of that. And uh, so I'd make a cassette. He'd go home and practice along with all of this stuff and places where I'd punched in and kind of just kind of made stuff work. And Jeff come back to the studio. And he said, let me try it. Let me try it now. And it's kind of like, wow, that sounds a lot better. And it, uh, he's got a tremendous work. Ethic. I'm not saying this because he's listening to this, but he's got a, phenomenal work ethic man he's yep. he, he's yep. to do the things he's done and uh, yeah he's focused and, uh, and he's a bright bright guy he's uh is one of my very best friends mm -hmm. uh and you know i owe him a lot too you know at, uh i remember we celebrated did a celebration of my 70th birthday party well uh, when was that four years ago <laughs> <laughs> Jeff uh, emceed the whole thing, and uh, oh, that's cool, really man. special. And everybody played from bands I've worked with to uh, the Atlanta Rhythm Section played, and and it was a special and everything. And Jeff, we don't talk every day or every week, but once we do connect with each other, it's hard to turn loose. Uh, he he comes over to our house here in uh, Fernandina Beach, and for a few days every now and then, he had Debbie cool. and. Uh, so we still kind of stay in touch on a certain thing. And I'll tell you, there's been a few times when opportunities come for Jeff to sit down and play on something next to me in a control room, whether it be in my studio at home or wherever, wherever. And it's immediately, it's just like it was back then. That's awesome, man. That's, that's just like that's it was back then. What a uh, couple of things that I just want to uh, comment on when you said I've always felt lucky to just be hanging on. I'll tell you something really interesting. The most successful, most talented guys that I've spoken to, and mind you, I'm coming close on 800 interviews. So that's a pretty good population are all like that. I don't know. It's a very, the humility in this industry. Now I'm sure the guys that are awful and think they're wonderful, but by and large, most of the people I've encountered anyway, and maybe it's just because most people refer people and usually birds of a feather flock together, but is everybody's really mellow, man, about their talents. Yeah. To think I didn't, I didn't have this vision of being a, 
working on a farm in South Georgia to, to this is what I'm going to be when I grow up, so to speak. I did not have that vision. It's just like one thing led to another. And it's kind of like, not that I made perfect decisions all the way, but it's kind of like things kind of just every now and then would fall in place, would fall yeah. in place. And, uh, and you, yeah, I kind of really did feel like I was glad to be, I'd be there. And it's kind of like, you know, one of the, uh, most, uh, important things to happen to me is all that work I'd done with the Atlanta rhythm section and nobody, there's no way to ever describe in detail the work that I did on those records and everything. Um, and Robert Nix, the drummer, the drummer for the band and, uh, just a few months before he passed away, he called me out of the clear blue and he'd never said anything like this. He said, Rodney, I just wanted to call and, uh, thank you for all the stuff that you did on our records and what the contributions you did and how you made our records, uh, sound and everything. And that, that just went all over me because yeah. I never heard anything from him like that before then. And, uh, and, uh, it's got, I always felt like I did <laughs> but, and you, so many times, you know, you don't get recognition for it or people, they get caught up in what they're doing and stuff like that. And so it doesn't go back because basically what I was doing on all the records was kind of very low key as far as just being the engineer, you know, and then everything. And, and, uh, and that conversation I have with him was very important to me and remains that way. Me and Barry Bailey and I have uh, spoken back and forth to each other because Jeff talks extensively of our method of recording to the fact, you know, that Jeff bought a Les Paul just like Barry Bailey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and on the, a lot of uh, the 38 records, that's the guitar he had uh, choose to to play. And uh, and Barry and I talked about that. And, and, and it's kind of like we never really talked to each other about the work we did together to kind of like, buddy Bowie was the producer of the band but there were so many times that buddy would just kind of like get us started on a song and he'd go out and uh, go to a restaurant or just separate himself from being involved and barry and i would sit there and and do all this recording now the genius part of that barry bailey's one of the best guitar players i ever i've ever worked with and was a very creative guy and uh and just to totally stoic <laughs> Jeff says the same thing about him. What a great player he is. Very just and can emotionally make his guitar just pull you into things that he's doing. It's kind of like yet he's a stoic guy. How weird is that? It I don't know. I don't I, he just found a way, found a way to make that's that's his instrument. That's his voice. Yeah, that's his emotional tool, man. His he communicates through that. Yeah, there, there are people like that. And sitting there sometimes would do stuff, you know, and just and Barry kind of play at stuff too, you know, and you're kind of like, well, kind of doing solo stuff. And, and early on with Barry and everything, you know, I noticed that, uh, wouldn't be totally in tune and then just didn't sound like Barry was like, hitting the strings. Right. And it took me almost a, a few years to realize that Barry Bailey would have this idea in his head, but he'd never played this before. So several passes we're doing on this thing. We were, rewinding the tape over and over again he's kind of getting his act together mm. to figure out what he's going to play and everything and then finally he gets that together and all of a sudden everything's in tune everything is the the pick against the strings is great the sound is great and everything so i'd hesitate to try to get a sound on him before we got serious you know about fine uh, him fine-tuning what he was going to play before i would kind of like say well let's add do this to the sound a little bit barry bailey was uh they was uh the history that i spent with him is totally positive on my end that's um, great so the same way with jeff those are the two mo two uh most uh, important guitar players that i worked did so much work with that uh i know that if i if if tomorrow I had the opportunity to be yesterday and we could go in the studio and everything, it would be exactly the same. That's cool. Except man. this time I could do a little bit more putting together solo tracks and stuff <laughs> like that than I could back uh, then. But, uh, but it would, it would still fall back on the same, uh, what, what gave you the, um, 
motive, what motivated you to suddenly sell, tell Jeff, Hey man, I'm, I'd love to engineer your record, but I really love to produce it. So the question is what motivated me to do that? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think, uh, the little bit of, of my wife always, uh, thinking that I had pretty good bit of talent and, uh, and I was not, not at the point that I, uh, could be. And, uh, and the fact is I was coming off a couple records that, uh, I'd worked really hard on and uh, they sounded real good and were, and they'd done really well. So, uh, but there's that point, you know, I don't know where it was a thing that was motivated by, okay, if I produce, I get a royalty. Hmm. I don't know how much of that came into it. I'm sure it did because I know that when the Atlanta rhythm section made it big, they all, they all got royalties. I didn't, I didn't get bonuses or anything. Yeah. But I don't, I get this. I don't get the sense that that would have been your main motive. I, I would have got that just from the conversation we've had your motive. That would have been like, you know, the ice, the cherry on the cake or the icing on the cake. That was like a bonus. I think, I think the thing I got to tell you this, this two little things here. Then I got through with the Atlanta rhythm section album. Uh, they had so into you on it and everything. So that was just a traditional thing. We ended the album, did the promotional tour, and that went on to bigger, bigger things. And I've been told for years if I well, were not doing well, we would finally do something that's going to work out. Why are you going to be compensated for it? Well, when it got to that point, there was no, there was not enough money to compensate. So I didn't get anything. So there was not bitterness on that end, but I realized. If I was going to do anything, I had to do it myself. And you had to do it ahead of time and get it in writing. So Skinner Street Survivors record, at the end of the record, Ronnie comes in the control room, sits down next to me. He said, Rodney, I want to give you some money for the work you've done on this record. And I want to give you some uh, royalties. And I'm looking <laughs> at him both. Like, those, those, are, those are two foreign words. <laughs> <laughs> bonus and royalties. and royalties yeah right i'd not heard those before he says i'm going to give you a thousand dollars a song for working wow. on this record and the thousand dollars a song happened but the royalties didn't uh, and then it became so okay we can't give you royalties but we'll give you bonus money as the album sells this was all hmm. word of mouth and between me and ronnie and uh, peter rudge and so that ever two hundred thousand copies the album sells will give you x amount of dollars and so of course the plane crashes yeah and the record's selling good i don't have a contract that says that so here's rodney trying to say uh i'm supposed to be getting my and i think i got one bonus check and i just said no this is not not what i'm gonna do but that that made me, you know it went from one thing to another so after then working all the uh, subsequent ARS albums always got bonus money for working on them. And eventually, Buddy and I co-produced the band together. Atlanta okay. Rooms. So you had a history leading up to that of, uh, I guess, what not to do. And we've all had it in our yeah. business career of where you, you, man, I didn't know I should have done this. I, I didn't know uh, how to, yeah. So you had a history of that. So it was really like the natural evolution for you to just like make it official. Say, Hey, I'd, I'd like to produce your record. Cause you knew based on yeah. history, you're going to produce 50 to 75% of it anyway. Well, yeah. I mean, might or a hundred percent, maybe even, <laughs> you know, might as well get it, get paid for it. Nothing, there's nothing wrong with there's everything right with that. Well, I tell you the, the proof proof was in the pudding when the, when that 38 came to Atlanta and we did those three songs Yeah, and we did yeah. this and everybody looked yeah. at each other and said, this is the whole band, this is what we want to do. Yeah. And it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like I, I can hang with this. I think I can hang with this. If, if I'd have gotten negative feedback from the record company at that point, I don't know what, what would have happened, but yeah. It's, so, you know, it's kind of like definitely the rocking in the night we did. And Mark Spector was instrumental in picking that song for the band to do. And uh, cause I got through, we got through making the record and everything. I go to New York and master the record with Bob Ludwig. And I go to, uh, to Mark Spector's offices at A&M records in New York. And we play the album and, uh, play the a side play the b side we're jamming it at the end of it he said man that sounds great 
Rodney, you did a really good job. Do you think we got a hit single on here? And it's like, uh, I think we got a single, Mark. I don't know whether it's a hit or not. And it's kind of like that was before the elevation of Don Barnes, the lead singer in the band. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about it and everything. He says it, he says he thought how important it was that they have a single that did real well on this next album as far as their future with A&M Records and that stuff. And I said, he says, can I play you a song? And he played me Rocking in the Night. Jim Peter could read. Jim, Jim Peter wrote that. Yeah, yeah. I had him on the show, man. He's the talk about a ball of fire and ball of energy, man. He he is. Uh, <laughs> and uh and it uh I he played the song for me and I said, That is not anything like what we've just recorded on this album. He says, I know it. He said, Do you think they uh, the band could do it? I said, I don't know. I said, uh it seemed to me like Donnie would have a problem singing it and uh Cause you, Peter writes everything that you got, you got to be a opera singer to be able to cover all the melodies and stuff he does. And, uh, so he said, do you mind, do you, do you mind if I send it down to the band? And I said, no, go ahead and, uh, send it down to the band, Jeff and, uh, and, uh, Don heard it. And, uh, and it's kind of like they realized immediately if, if, if they were going to do it, that Don was gonna, probably going to have to sing it. And so I think Donnie heard it after that and he wasn't, into it i think donnie was intimidated by the song okay because of the versatility you would have to have to really make the song come out and so we determined that dom was gonna sing it and um, i was i was a van zant believer you know i never gave up on donnie uh, being able to sing a hit song we never made that happen and never could get it to happen but and on the final version of that i had donnie to go out there and ghost vocal almost the entire thing and i could still i can hear donnie in the song and everything um and he sang the choruses and stuff didn't sing all the verse stuff don did all that but uh but his voice is in there and uh and so it's kind of like i felt like i didn't totally exclude him from that and i worked with donnie so hard and everything that uh you know because i owed him not only for the fact they gave me an opportunity to work with them and produce some everything but but for his brother, for his brother. Yeah. I figured that was in the back of your mind. Yeah. I always, always was in there. And, uh, so you just and, painted forward. Yeah. And, and I got to tell you, working with Donnie and Johnny, both of them, mm. there was, it was a happy thing. It was just a really, it was so much fun and everything. And, uh, and no, not so much doom and gloom and the, and the whole process and everything. And, uh, and both those uh, two brothers, Donnie and Johnny, just got the greatest laugh in the world. And uh, and uh, Johnny was always pushing me. Johnny would push the dickens out of him. We had a 24 track, and he wanted to put 48 tracks on that 24 <laughs> track. And, uh, but you know, I enjoy that whole thing. Thing, you know, I don't think it, I don't know how it could have been any better for me. You know, it's kind of like. Uh, well, what was around at that time, maybe the opportunity of working with a couple of different bands and stuff like that. But, uh, just the way everything kind of fell into place. Uh, you, man, are you kidding? Leonard Skinner, 30 special. I mean, Almond brothers. I mean, this, well, let, all, let's just go back on Almond brothers. I should have made some notes on that. I did not do the Almond brothers as the Almond brothers. I did those two songs with Dickie Betts. Oh, with second coming. Yeah. And then on some of the Almond Brothers records, or well, some of Dickie's solo records, Dickie called me up, Studio One, and he says, can I come up there and do some guitar overdubs? Because Capricorn is booked. And we had that little bit of history going back to 1968. And so he'd come up and spend a few days up in Atlanta and would work on guitar parts on, on his solo album stuff. So I worked with him again. And then... Did you work on the, he had one solo, the it was a pattern disruptive, I think. I, I do not know the songs that I worked on. Okay. Yeah, because that's... he was kind of in, out, then come back and do a couple of songs. And I never heard the end, the, the ending yeah. thing, of the end result of all that. And then Greg, I didn't really know Greg. Greg came out of Studio One a couple of times because he's kind of friends with uh, Robert Nix. Mm -hmm. And I uh, met him and everything. And of course i kind of followed his career and he'd done one of my all-time favorite songs uh 
silver dollars and uh and uh i just love that song i love greg's voice and everything and i met when i was in the band with the bushman we met the almond joys down in jacksonville did you the almond joys greg and Dwayne had gotten on a greyhound bus and come up to jacksonville to the biggest music store there in jacksonville and for Dwayne to buy an amplifier and so these two guys come in they got greg's got pretty long blonde hair and uh, both of them and, and uh, we got talking and everything and uh and then they said who they were and everything why they were there and, and uh talked for pretty a while and uh, they gave me one of their cards they had the almond joys on there wow uh, you still have that i do not know where that card is oh man <laughs> and uh, i've kept it forever and uh but anyway i'm out in uh california what, what album did he what, what amp did he buy just curious i think it was uh I think it was like a twin fender twin okay yeah and uh, so that seemed like that was like the perfect size amp they could get back on the bus and get it back home and kind of what he was playing back then uh marshalls were not kind of uh big time at that point marshalls had not even come out yet this was probably in 65 66 so it was right before they started coming out. yeah, yeah. did you know a guy sorry in jacksonville did you know doyle dykes no Okay. Acoustic guitar, incredible player. He was from Jacksonville as well. But I'm out in California working on a, uh, working with a band out there called Cruzados. Mm -hmm. I got this gig with a telephone call. Uh, <laughs> it's a Tex-Mex band and, uh, and they listened to some of the stuff I'd done. So they got on a conference call with me and everything. And so the lead singer of the band was Tito Lariva. And, uh, we talked together on the phone and, uh, and just generally and the how I approached recording and doing stuff and everything. And he, he signed me up on a phone call, on a phone call. I'll go there out go, to, man. I get on a plane, go out to California. It's the first time I've seen these guys. And, uh, so we actually work really well together, but while I'm out there, I get a call, uh, that, uh, Greg's manager and Greg's out in California and, uh, they're looking for Greg to do a, uh, solo album. And he hadn't recorded in either nine or 10 years at that point. And, uh, so would I be, uh, op opening a meeting with them at the record company? And so at Epic records, so you I got did, it. I'm feeling pretty good after you getting that call. Here you are flying out to California from, uh, for a new client that like, yeah, okay, come on out. And then you're, everything's paid for you doing the record. And then while you're there, great. That's gotta be like, oh my God, uh, it's, this is pretty cool. It, yeah. it's got kind of like you feeling your Cheerios and everything. So, you know, I go in and Greg and I never said a half a dozen words to each other. <laughs> I go in and, and I sit down, you know, it's kind of like, I found, you know, getting that gig with the Cruzado was Cruzados was a big deal because they didn't know me. Yeah. So when they got on the phone with me, it's kind of like you and I already know, you just try to be who you are and people that are perceptive and everything can pick up on that. And it's mm -hmm. kind of like, you don't try to talk, tell them that you know a lot more than what you know, you try to tell them kind of what you do and kind of how you approach things. and. So I sat there with Greg and I talked to him and everything and, uh, and about, you know, the, the armor brothers, what they'd done and everything. And I told him how, how I kind of worked and everything. And, uh, and he had heard some of the stuff I'd done at that time. And, uh, and at the end of that conversation, the conversation of finding a producer for Greg was over. That's got, that, So he, he hired you. He hired me there on the spot. Oh my. So you're thinking I'm pretty good at this phone call. I'm pretty good at this stuff, man. I need to get some more leads in. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to be going to meet anybody face to face. Really. I can just do it on the phone. It's a waste of time. It's, this in-person stuff. Cruzados, yeah. You may know them from the movie, uh, uh from dawn from dusk till uh, dawn oh yeah of course yeah but the yeah. band that plays that turns in the monsters yeah that was them that was the Cruzados. that's pretty cool that's pretty cool i did i did two albums with those guys and uh they had it was a different thing you know they did one spanish song that i had no idea what he was singing uh, is, is that weird to be doing a song and you're mixing it and you don't know what like 
because no, but this was this was a ballad, and you could tell the words. Okay. He kind of he kind of hung on to and everything. He put uh, the, a real emotion into it and everything. And I'd say, well, what are you saying right there? And he would interpret it for me and everything. Oh, okay. And it's kind of like uh, we so we worked pretty well together. And uh, and need to say, I got the gig with Greg. Then the process of uh, okay, where are we going to record record Greg? Because this time that this time I'm out of Studio One. I'm going around you're, the country, you're, you're country. freelancing yeah and so greg wants to do down in miami his management thinks that miami is probably not a great influence on greg mm -hmm. and and uh so i talked to uh i can't remember his name guy up in memphis at his studio and uh and that seemed pretty good and but we wound up in criteria in miami and Who, did, this was for the uh i'm no angel and, and i'm before... no angel when i heard the song they sent the song i'm no angel to me and i thought this is a hit it's a great track and uh greg didn't write this but greg should have written this because yeah. this is a this is greg and totally. uh and uh so when i heard that song i said yes I, I could do this and everything so we did we did some kind of traditional stuff for greg and we did some kind of new stuff and i'm no angel was kind of a different for him by all means but it was a hit record it great was, great record that did really did really well and uh and got to i got the opportunity to work with another one of my favorite guitar players dan, uh, danny toller dan toller i was just gonna ask you oh who's, who's man yeah oh man we did the same thing craig we cut the tracks so he comes in, comes in the control comes in the room, sits, sits, sits <laughs> down by me. I said, this is going to do it. And he got, got his amp right next door in the vocal booth on the side of the control room and uh, put mics up in there and everything. And so, so Dan sits there with me and we, we do all his overdubs that same, same way. That's and, awesome. That's and so and cool. here's the thing, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you know, you've got to say I'm by the seat of my pants and it's kind of like, I'm the kind of guy too that I didn't sit in there and kind of study what we had listened to what we had done the day before and figured out well, this was what we needed. Uh, this is what this needed or that. I kind of generally felt like we needed to do some things, not exactly what it was. And I just felt like when we get the studio, it'll all work. And 90 something percent of the time, it all worked. That's you know? awesome, man. <laughs> and it's kind of like at a, so Dan but, there's a, but you know what? When you're sitting next to somebody, there's a vibe. Yes. And that's uh, just as important. Well, you get that. It's exactly what you just said. It's a vibe. And you kind of lock in on each other. You know, I'm doing one thing and they're doing another. But I know I could sit there and watch them playing and, and listen to what's coming out and everything. I can tell when they're playing the right stuff or that didn't quite hit a note right and just to instantly know what that is and everything and where it is and say, we need, we need to punch in right here. And it's kind of like, I said, start playing along with what you were playing with right before then. And I'll punch you in and we'll fix that spot and keep on going. And 90% of the time, it was just like punch in fix, go on with the thing. Maybe you go, okay, we're going back up here. we got to do this part over again. Cause something a lot of times the guitar, tracks you didn't have a lot of tracks to put different tracks of guitar down you had to kind of make this part up as you were going and as far as you know there was not going to be another track okay and especially solo stuff and if i had the tracks i would put solo stuff together but there was that uh kind of locking in on the, what's going on and everything and trying not to get in the way of somebody trying those uh all those guitar players were trying to feel not only play, but also to feel, get the, uh, the vibe inside them, the soul in them, the emotion in them to come out through their hands and their amp and everything. Sure. And it's kind of, you don't want to be the guy sitting there just kind of making them do something or other that doesn't mean anything. So it's kind of like, so you, you learn just how far you can get into what they're doing without getting too far into it and making it and golly it's same way i you know i got the opportunity to work with the doobie brothers on uh two albums when they decided to get back together and uh and guess what tommy johnston and uh, pat simmons they're right there in the control room with me not together but uh 
but it will cut basic tracks. They would both be in the control room. But when we did overdubs and all that, right in the control room, Pat Simmons was one of the best human beings I've ever worked with just as far as his enthusiasm and, uh, and just wanting to play all these parts, way too many of them sometime, but <laughs> he always was never lacking uh, for an idea and, uh, and any kind of contribution he could make to what was going on. Uh, and I, that was the thing to me. It's kind of like, I was a big fan of the band from their yeah. beginnings, you know, I mean, they, that first record they did hit my heart, you know, it's listen to the music was, uh, couldn't get much better to me. Great song. And the whole thing. And, and there again, they started making this reunion album after they hadn't recorded a long time. They get two producers from New York and they get in there and these producers start going off on, on these guys. And, uh, especially Tommy Johnston, just like, uh, play is not good. Your lyrics suck, uh, this, th and just, <laughs> and they get about, I don't know, somewhere between the third and a halfway through the album. And they all had a meeting and said, is anybody having any fun? Good. So they fired them. They fired them. So, how'd they get a hold of you? I get a call that, uh, and, uh, they're looking for somebody to complete this album with them. In the meantime, I've started buying Macintosh computers and I started learning how to sync up stuff and a little bit of MIDI stuff. And, and so I fly out to San Francisco and, uh, in some hotel out there, I sit down and, and I've got copies of stuff and I start playing and I said, this is what I think we could do here and, uh, and add here. And if we could maybe start this song where the whole band's not playing and everything. So every, so everything, I kind of chose my words carefully and everything and spoke to them and everything. And it was done. They said, we want you to come out and finish this record with us. And it's, so I come back to Atlanta and I, <laughs> I take every bit of the equipment I got, which is not enough because I had done a record with MIDI and syncing to uh time code and all that stuff. So I'm kind of thrown in the fire and, with a band that I totally admire with a, with a very successful band. And, and it's like most people that I've met in my life. And I think you, you know, this too stars are stars, but they're also people a hundred, a hundred percent. And, uh, once, once you sit down with somebody and it's like, we sat down at a hotel out in California and sit there and start playing music, just talking about their music and everything. Then you just kind of, you know, you're talking to a person and they're talking to somebody that's not saying, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do that for you, but this is what I think we could do. And this is kind of like, uh, and it, that that's a that's the biggest part to me is kind of like i've never was like all the rap stars that i've worked with and everything that come in my place and they got this they got this professional wrestling persona about it. yeah i totally equate it to professional wrestling and it's like when, when they're around out. there when they're around their peers and everything they put on this uh act and they talk a certain way and they act and they're doing all this stuff and everything but I felt every, every one of them that came out and sat down in my little studio at home in Atlanta to do work on their, uh, album or whatever, they're there about an hour and we're just talking like normal people. Yeah. And every now and then I did some of the lyrics go by and I said, and I look around and some of them bring out their little kids <laughs> to do the, to come out to the sessions, to come out, come out of the session. So they're kind of babysitting back there and I'm playing this stuff and it's kind of like, wow. Oh yeah, something that little kids should not be hearing. <laughs> well, they're, they're actually they're actually too small to pick up on that. But when I turn around and I look at him, and he said, and one guy, I remember one guy said, "I know, Mr. Mills. I'm just trying to figure out a way to make some money." That's so funny. Wow. <laughs> yeah. No, I I have if somebody once we I've been very fortunate with this show. I mean, so this it it's you know, and. uh, someone said, why do you think that the show has done well? And I said, for that reason, I said, because I think everybody's the same. I don't, people don't, I mean, just because somebody was an expertise in a field, they still, everybody worries about their kids, worries about their family, yeah. their health, no matter how much money you got, you got too many bills to pay, not enough time. We're all like got these basic things in common. And so I've never, I've never been like, 
everybody's the same, man. You know, it's like, you don't have to do it. When it gets down to it, if you get an opportunity to get to know somebody just a little bit, you realize they're just the same, you know, it, uh, they're just like, I, you're talking to real people, you're doing these things, you know, and it's not, not like we're not in here to die to do something heroic. We're trying to get in here trying to do the best thing that we can do, you know, yeah. it's, it's not anything to, uh, and I don't think any, most of the people I work with this that never approach too much about their ego. Yeah. Involved. A few people, but, uh, but the, the ego's not so much involved as you're in there making a record and you know how important this is. And so it can't be anything, but really doing the best you can do, perform the best you can do. And me, as well as, the uh, the bands or musicians or guitar players that I work with, that's what it came down to. But, you know, in a way too, a lot of it was fun, especially 38 special i do that first record with them and it sells three times what their their first record sold and yeah it's kind of like and, and said so, wow and we do the second record and we hear the hold on loosely demo with jim peterick and uh, don and jeff and it's like i remember i remember get a phone call from mark specter their manager he said rodney we got to hit record here. Try not to screw it up. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> and we all, we all felt that way, but you know, there, but after we did that record, after, especially after we did, we did so actually the first record rocking and Night, we, there's a lot of pressure taken off because, okay, there's some promise here. There's some real promise here and everything. So the second record, the wild eyes Southern boys takes off. And I know, uh, and one of the highlights of my life is uh, I'd done some gold records before then, but I had not produced the records. I've been an integral part of it. And 38 Special, Mark Spector, there again, called me up uh, one night. He said, Rodney, uh, Wild Eyes Southern Boy has just been certified gold, RIAA certified gold. And it's like, it's almost like uh, your wife having a baby. Yeah. <laughs> it was that that much of a celebration i remember i'm sure i remember uh well you got it wasn't just a you got validated because you, it, had, a, that, that, you had done this work before <laughs> without any without not even without any validation without any credit so well, i totally yeah. that like well that 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 yeah. uh, that was one of the best feelings to, yeah. obviously to me and my wife you know it's just kind of like we work so hard to make all this work and everything. And finally we get something that works here. I'm actually go out buying cigars, buddy Bowie's at the studio doing some vocal stuff with Ronnie Hammond, the singer of the Atlanta rhythm section. I walk in, I'm passing out cigars <laughs> Good for and, you. and see, buddy would not do that deal where he was lend us his name in order for me to get that production job. Right. So I walk in the studio and I said, 38 record just went gold. He said, they're probably sending it back. So I'm half on back. I said, no, it's been RIAA certified. <laughs> then, it, you know, it, went, it was gold. Then it went platinum. And it's kind of like, after then, we never heard from the record company. <laughs> yeah, they let you alone, right? Man. They left us alone. You know, there'd be a couple of phone calls every now and then. Uh, but they left, let us make the records we wanted to make. And, uh, and, and we had a lot of fun making those records and, and a lot of, a lot of fun off a lot of uh, tears and hard work and stuff it's just kind of like you don't tend to not to dwell on anything like how hard you worked on it you just kind of listen to the end result i can go yeah. back to the atlanta rhythm section records the first ones i did and i haven't listened to them in three years and i listen to them and it's like wow i can i can hear all the parts there i can remember recording all those things I can remember Robert Nixon's, uh, the, uh, tip of his stick, trying to get that certain ping out of the ride symbol for it to sound just right. And, uh, if I lost you getting over you there. No, I'm here. I'm just listening. But, the, but to, just to hear all that stuff and everything. And you kind of like, well, no, they didn't achieve a lot of success on those early records, but those records are really, they're well-made. They sound real good. The songs are good. Uh, and uh so that 
I get pumped up. It was a couple of years ago. I was out walking a lot. And so I got into listening to all the, all the old records you did. So I could just put them on my, at that time, my iPod, I think yeah, it was iPod. Yeah. Just put it in random play. And it's kind of like, man, I've done a lot of stuff. <laughs> oh, no, no doubt, man. Uh, it's pretty cool though. You know, you talk, go back to uh, Liberty DeVito. You yeah. Know, Oh yeah, that's right. I, a, I was I was so. I have, I have not been face to face with Liberty DeVito since he was at Studio One in Atlanta, Georgia, and I won't say this was around 1971 or 1972. And uh, so he did two albums there with a guy named Richard Supa, and I can't remember Supa's real, last real name. Uh, it Richie Supa. Um, uh, it's like Scarletto maybe or something. Uh, yeah, Scar. Not yeah. Yes, it is like that. Something and at like that, that time, we still talked the other day. It's like at that time, his mother lived down in Miami, <laughs> and he was flying down there, and he was going back up north. But he, uh, Richard Super, he was in uh, the original cast of I think Jesus Christ Superstar. It, it was some big play on Broadway. I remember some big play on Broadway. Ha ha Hairspray, nah. not hair. It might have been hair. I don't think it was Jesus Christ Superstar. Okay. Might have been, it was a something similar in that genre, sort of, and a pretty big, pretty big deal. And yes. So, so he came down, and he's just a great guy to work with, and everything. And Liberty DeVito uh, sets up his drums and everything. And it's one of the first uh, things that I did outside of our fabricated drum booth. Uh -huh. He set up his drums outside in the actual studio, and uh, and I totally enjoyed recording those albums that he played on and everything uh the great player and everything but uh got a story hey, about richard richard super let me just tell, tell you this go ahead ask me what you're gonna say well i was just gonna say he must have thought a lot of you because you didn't work together a lot yet he mentioned you in his book as you know i sent you that i, I was shocked i'm reading it. i'm like oh my god everybody's <laughs> related <laughs> Everybody, almost yeah. we're doing vocals with the uh, with super one night out of studio one and super wants uh he wants all the lights off out into the studio. And so I'm in the control room and the control room got a lot of glass in it. So he said, I didn't have any, uh, uh, window coverings or anything. So he said, I want it dark. So I'd cut out all the lights in the uh, control room. And, you know, I got the lights on the equipment and the tape machine They're they're there, but it's dark. And so he's singing the song all of a sudden he says, uh, Rodney, uh, stop the tape. He, I, I said, what is it? What is it? he says, you, you need to stop the tape. And he told me to stop the tape. And so my immediate reaction was, to, I knew something was wrong. So I was going over to where all the light switches were. And he was trying to tell me, no, no, don't. And he wasn't no way to tell me to leave the light switch off because the cops had come around the back and discovered the back door was open. And they had come through the back bay and then came into the back door of the studio, into the studio. And they see a guy in the dark and he's got on headphones there and he's dancing around singing everything. They can't, I've got these little tiny speakers on the room and that's all they see is this guy jumping around out there singing. So one guy has got his rifle down on his gun down on his uh, knee and he walks up to super and taps him on the back. He and thought he was he had broken into the place. They th he thought he was dead or something. And then he turns around and realizes it's cops and he tells me to stop the tape, but he realizes he's got his weed all out on the piano <laughs> oh and that was a big deal back then if they caught you with some weed they didn't say anything about it this guy those policemen says we just thought we didn't know what to think says we we thought we had a we had us a wild somebody wild totally wild and crazy oh we didn't know, we didn't know what we were getting into and it he had, they didn't do anything about that the cops finally learned you know we were a studio and the, there was a few times we put a marshall cabinet in that back thing and go out to this and it to get a ambient sound mm -hmm. and the neighbors would call and we left to turn it down and everything but super, okay he about fainted and everything but uh made sure that back door was closed after that but <laughs> wow that's a funny story so cool man. the only other time i ever saw him was at airport atlanta airport mary and i were going somewhere and he just came came through on a i think going down to miami and uh that's the last time i saw him and and really that second album that he did that uh, Liberty played on. That was the last time I saw Liberty face to face. That's wild. Yeah. He must've thought a hell of a lot. You, you got to think a lot of someone 
40, 50, 50 years later to put them in your book. That's pretty cool, man. They're pretty cool. So, yeah. And then and, and Jeff tells me they're playing together. And I, it's the first thing that hit, fits my mind. I know this guy. Is the I don't story. know him, but I know him. Yeah. <laughs> How did you, uh, so how did the first, like, how did you get into the rap thing? Okay. So, and I shouldn't say the rap thing. How did you get into the genre of, of mass? Hip -hop, uh, yeah. Hip -hop, rap, uh, yeah. Trap uh, music. Yeah. So the, uh, at one point I broke away from studio one because it was sold to Georgia state university. And, oh, okay. Uh, they made it a teaching facility and everything. And I still continue to mix stuff in there, but, uh, but I kind of got away from that. And, and so, and I was going out to California to do Cruzados, doing this, going down to Miami. And I was basically living in, you know, two albums of radiators in new Orleans. I'm staying from, I love month. that band, man. I saw them in the Ritz in New York city. They, I yep. wish they had made, made it bigger, man. They were a great band. They were great band and everything. So I'm, I'm working with these. And meanwhile, I've got two daughters that are in high school. Hmm. and uh i'm not participating in anything they're doing and uh and to the point that i didn't know exactly what i was going to do because at that point the west coast uh grunge music took off hmm. and uh and it did not take off with me so this is like in the 80s yes late yeah. 80s yeah late 80s late eighties and I continued on into the early nineties mm -hmm. continue to do that stuff. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm missing out on stuff. They're both cheerleaders. I love basketball. I love football. I can't, I don't see them. Uh, Mary's having to do all this stuff and everything. And so it's kind of like, I need to find something that I can stay home and do. And, uh, and at that time I picked up a copy of mix magazine mm -hmm. And uh, Digital Design had just come out with this new software called Masterless CD that you could make a master CD that was good for uh, CD duplication or replication. And so I got thinking, I've been going all these years up to Bob Ludwig, and he's been mastering all this stuff. And I said, you know, I'm going to try to take, I don't think I can take Bob Ludwig's place by any means, but I think there's a lot of music being recorded and in Atlanta, there were maybe maybe one other person at that time doing any kind of mastering. And so I kind of put it in my mind and trying to figure out how much it would cost, what kind of computers I need. Fortunately, I was kind of up to date on all my uh, computer stuff. And uh, and I said, okay, for X amount of dollars, I can buy this, a Pro Tool system, make these master CDs, send them to the rec to the CD plants. And uh, I think this might work. I, I didn't, it wasn't like one of these things where, okay, I'm going to do this. So I'm not going to do anything else. I thought I would, I didn't have that all figured out, but almost immediately I kind of hung it out that I was going to do mastering. I kind of got everything together. It worked and I figured out how to make everything work. And then a couple of friends of mine worked at a, at a uh, rap hip hop label there in Atlanta. And they called me up and said, Rodney, have you ever worked on any rap music? And I said, Nope, but, uh, I'm willing to give it a try. And so almost immediately, you know, I went from working with rock bands, guitar players to, uh, to rap music. And, uh, that's what totally different genres, different, uh, it's just, it was all over the place. Uh, but there again, when I started the mastering stuff, Craig, uh, that, uh, Lefevre sound thing came back and this was almost in a daily thing. There was kind of like, I'd do two or three things in a day's time and none of them resembled each other. You just had to have the ability to kind of get your head in with what they were doing and try to make it sound as good as you can make it sound. And, uh, and just not become a part of that music, but be able to contribute to what they're doing and yeah. make, as far as, uh, make the final sound on what they were doing. So it's kind of like I started doing that and it's then it, all the other stuff started happening because of my reputation, as far as uh, engineering and producing and everything, I got to a lot of stuff, but my, my reputation for engineering and producing all this rock stuff meant nothing 
to these to the rap uh, community in Atlanta. It was how how could you do quality work for them? Sure. And and at that time, most all, everybody came out, and it was that same thing. You know, it's kind of it was a little bit of push. to said, Mr. Mills, do you know anything about this bass music? You know, you know, we like a lot of bass. I said, well, I was a bass player. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to look out after your base. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. man. And, um, uh, and it, you, got a, you had enough, a, enough of a little bit for, for them to at least say, all right, I'll give them a shot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is all you need, man. You know what, what, what I always just say, uh, uh, you just got to get your foot, foot in the door. Once it's in there, it's up to you to keep that door open, but just give me a foot. And you know? and and especially Atlanta is such a huge market. For, yeah, for rap, uh, rap yeah. hip hop, Massive. and it's kind of like word of mouth. I've never advertised my business, the the mashing business, except for my website and stuff like that. But I never made a push to do ads and any kind of thing like that. So word of mouth just became it's more work than I could possibly get done. And so I hired uh people to come in and kind of answer the phones and take care then finally it was the point where okay i master the songs i'm done with it and they would take it clean up the beginnings and the end put them in the order they're supposed to be on the album the right. people work for me and we like a machine you know in a week's time i'd go through this stuff and it's like easily in a uh year's time i do a thousand different uh things wow i, I was used to doing maybe two album projects a year <laughs> And that, wow, you're doing like a thousand. That's a mate. That's a lot of work, man. That's a hundred. That's 90, call it a hundred records a month. And I'm it's, assuming you weren't working around the clock again. Or pretty late. Pretty yeah. Late. Okay. And then, okay. We, then we started recording some of the stuff. <laughs> oh man. Well, Listen. you know what, but you're that guy, man. You're gonna, you, it goes back to work ethic, man. I hate to sound like, but you know that you're you're going to do something you're going to do it right don't try that's don't just try. right well right that but you're going to give you're going to say hey it should be done like this while you're here let's do it oh yeah. it's like uh even yesterday i'm doing this one song for this for this rap artist and everything so they get to the end of the song and it just shuts off it just sounds like why did they do that so I go in there and it gets to that last note and everything. I add some little ambience and reverb tail to it. And it sounded kind of not anything draws the way out, but it just makes it sound like it ends. Yeah. It just cuts off. And so I, I'm not looking for anybody unless I get somebody said, man, we, what'd you do to the end of the song? <laughs> so, yeah. I take a, so I take a little bit of freedom with the stuff. Sometimes, sometimes people send me stuff and it's kind of like, I don't know what they were listening to when they, they were hearing this and everything, <laughs> but it doesn't need, it needs to sound quite different from this. And, uh, and a lot of times that works really well. And, and you get known for doing stuff like that. And sometimes the way it is nowadays, people, you know, they've got pro tools and they've got everything instant recall on everything and they could work on stuff. Do you think that they've got it sounding pretty good? And, uh, and a lot of the stuff does sound pretty good. Hmm. But they're, you know, the rap music and everything, you got to find a way to make everything work. You know, the, the bass sometimes, especially in Atlanta is, uh, is bass driven or 808 driven a lot of times. And so you've got to have room for that to be big in the song and you got to find a way to make the vocals be understood too. And, uh, and it's kind of like sometimes people send me stuff where the bass is way too high. I know it's too high. I can't, I can't hear the vocals. Yeah. So I'll rebalance it and everything and get it to sound where it sounds like stuff that's on the out there that's doing really well and everything. And, uh, and it's kind of like send that back to them and they're usually cool with it because in the meantime, I've got my settings for rap music, which makes it hotter than any other genre of music I work with. Okay. And that's, that's even backed off a little bit lately, but, but it's just amazing. When I first started, I was not expecting to get involved in that. And, uh, and I found myself I, at some point proving myself with some of the artists who had had some pretty good success. Uh, uh, freak nasty was a guy that he had a multi-million selling album that he did on cassette, <laughs> eight track cassette. And, uh, so he comes to me wondering what, what, what are you going to do this stuff? Make me said, I already, I sold 7 million albums on my uh, thing. I did on cassette. 
That's amazing. And uh, it's kind of, so it's kind of like, I don't know. We'll see. And, and it, but it worked out real well. The, you know, those people I've noticed you had on the bone crusher. Yeah. Bone crusher is one of the guys. This was, this was a smart guy. You know, this was an educated guy. Uh, uh, he came in and we matched that first song, the scared song. Uh, and, uh, he's got no record deal. He's got not anything really going on. So, so it's basically, he's getting out promoting this thing, getting in his car and doing all these clubs like up in the Carolinas and all over Atlanta and, and Georgia and everywhere. And so he kind of gets the little stuff going on a little bit. And so he gets on the next level where he's got some representation. Then he gets a record deal. And, uh, and, uh, so I do, I did where I did that first album for him. It did really well for him. And, uh, I know I'm watching the Atlanta football one day. And so he's doing that song at the beginning of the beginning of the game. Well, he's doing the clean version of the song. <laughs> all the people up in the stands are doing the dirty version. Of <laughs> so he got banned. He got really got criticized for doing all those dirty lyrics live on live television. But he didn't and do it. it. He didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a contribution to that. And that was one of the first time things I know. I remember doing his album and it, and it was getting put out and everything. And so my wife and I go on a trip to over to Savannah mm -hmm. and I go to a flea market and there's his album. It hadn't even, hadn't even been released yet. And there's already bootlegs on it. That's crazy, man. Oh, that is crazy. Uh, how funny was it the first time when when you were getting ready to go to the studio and your wife said, "Oh, who are you working with today?" And you said, "Oh, Freak Nasty." <laughs> <laughs> the, the first time you, you had to say something like that, she must have been like, "What?" <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you one. You know, the, my master studio in Atlanta is in my house up there, and uh, I've got uh, George Clinton booked. Yeah, that doing, was, that's cool. We're doing Talk a big, that. big project on him where he's kind of putting together all the unreleased stuff that he's done the extra takes they did on stuff and uh and i'm downstairs getting all that prep and everything i think his engineer there but george clinton comes to the house so like a limousine brings him up instead of him going around the back of the house and coming in my uh, uh, door down there which everybody does oh the studio the garage, yeah the garage door was up right <laughs> So he so, goes into the garage and knocks on the door and Mary goes to the door and opens it up. And there he is, you know, he's got all this colored hair and, uh, and if, and he's just a lot bigger than life. And yeah. uh, it's, yeah, I think Mary said, I think you're looking for my husband. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun, man. They made a documentary about it. It was not, I don't know if you saw it. It was pretty scathing. You know, it, I think that whole thing where he put all that stuff together and, uh, I don't think he included uh, a lot of people he probably should have included with that. And uh, it was, but it was a lot of stuff. It was a ton of stuff, man. And they had like, it was almost like a jury trial. They had like witnesses lined up one after the other. I was like, holy smoke. So, and look, there's three sides to every story. I don't know what's what, but it was a, I was, yeah. it was, it was disappointing as a fan to see that. I don't know if there's any truth to it. Is it fake news? Who knows? But it was like scathing. I don't know. I didn't ever yeah. got involved in that. I, I know when we did the mastering on that, it was like double album, double CD, maybe even more than that, but, uh, getting that together and keeping up with all of it. And, uh, the t song song titles were not correct. Uh, they'd move these songs around. It was kind of like, I like to never got through with the final versions of that stuff before, I guess all that stuff started. There might've been some songs we took off that was part of that uh he had not got clearance oh, okay. from everybody involved because it was just him doing this project it was not not the whole uh band so to speak yeah. interesting yeah that was sad to see that any other like gigs that you want to talk about that were significant to you i think uh we've you know, we talked to you talked a little bit about you know like the rap Atlanta scene as far as rap hip hop and uh, and uh, and it's got this uh we won't call it trap music. Yeah, I had that uh, Gucci Gucci Mane. Yeah, 
what what are the what I want to know is what are the challenges that presents in engineering because that's got to be tough. Well, I did mostly did mastering for him, and it was uh, and he was kind of one of the originators of kind of the Atlanta sound, and uh, and the Atlanta sound is basically uh, all these guys discovered these uh, Roland TR eight oh eights, and they started making these beats with them and everything, and uh, and it was kind of like so. That genre of music by them, it was kind of semi laid back and it was kind of like definitely uh, bass driven, that 808 bass driven and everything. And so there was, and you know, I remember we got one of those things at Studio One and, and st our thinking was, okay, it's supposed to sound like a kick drum. It doesn't sound like a kick drum. It doesn't sound like a snare drum. Put it over there. We're not going to use that thing. <laughs> so there's a little bit of truth that all these guys uh, found these things at pawn shops and for nothing. Right. And started making beats with them and everything. And so it, the deal was, you know, it's kind of like you get this semi laid back, uh, a beat going and thing. It's got a groove to it and everything. And, uh, and, and it's kind of like a real exaggerated hi hats. Sometimes that's still some of the biggest problems I'll run across. They got these runaway hi hats going on all, all over the top end of the record <laughs> and, and trying to tame that back just a little bit, but, but it's that thing now, you know, it's kind of like, so you're not doing, uh, you're not doing trap rhymes or anything like that, but there is a trap kind of kind of rhythm to what you're doing. And it's, it's kind of a, a triplet or a offbeat kind of thing. They do a lot in the phrasing of the, what they do and everything that kind of enhances that whole overall thing. Now I get everything. One song would be, maybe it's a trap. Next song is just sound like plant. I call it just rap music. It's a, right. it's not really 808 there it's a lot more versatility and stuff nowadays you know some of my favorite stuff i just did the past few days this guy he actually had a real realistic snare drum no way but it was in totally in your face and uh that's what he wanted and everything and it it worked really good now now that's probably got a nomenclature to it that people know but i don't right I don't, right i don't try to name the stuff or or uh I know generally what I'm dealing here with, and I do get some stuff. It's like, okay, it doesn't have 808s in there going, and it's not in there on the low end at all. And it's kind of like, well, did they forget to put bass in this? No, they intentionally did not want to do that. And you get, I get stuff from different parts of the country that, it's exaggerations on one or the other, like uh, stuff up north is not 808 driven a lot of stuff out on the west coast is not 808 driven but the atlanta stuff and the, what you want to call trap music is still 808 driven that's the thing about it that some of the the biggest uh even uh uh snoop doggy dog has got a just a unique sound to his voice yeah and uh you know it's so it's kind of come around you know i get uh gotten rap stuff where they've uh, gotten snoop to do a verse on the song and so these I, are guys that are fairly well known then. No. Oh, really? Well, they just got, email them say, yeah. got the money together. They sent a track out to LA and he's done a verse on it and he's charged them like $50,000. Wow. Good for him. And, uh, and so, so they they send me the song. He's got, he's on the first verse. So they send me a song, another song. It's the same verse, but it's on a different song. <laughs> Hey man, I spent 50 grand on this. He's going to be on every <laughs> song, every song on my record, every song on my album. Wow. That's I actually got a, a rap client that uh, got the license to use the uh, intro of uh, sweet home Alabama. That's interesting. And uh, so so they looped it and everything. And, and they did every version they could think of to do that. Uh, yeah. But that would probably do well because it's a hit song. Yes. And instantly recognizable. Yeah. Instantly. Like and uh, I, I think I had some mediocre success with it, but I have no idea what uh, Judy Van Zant or any of the other people, what, uh, <laughs> Gary Washington, uh, of course, Ed passed away now, but uh, uh, those those people are still doing well off that one song. Yeah, I'm sure. Hey, um, let me ask you a few more questions. And yes, I, sir. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time. Uh what are your top three desert island discs i know I, maybe that's the one thing i was not gonna 
<laughs> Do you know what people, this is a, I, I get people emailing me or responding. Like, I love how your guests will pour their heart out to you and tell them like how they recovered from alcoholism or, you know, <laughs> abuse or, you know, three divorces. But when you ask them, what are your three desert island discs? He goes, they all freeze in their tracks. It is the most difficult question to answer. And it is a tough question to answer. It is so tough. I think, uh, gosh, I think. Just uh, for now, just for like okay, right now. now like, I yeah. think Hotel California would be right in there. Mm -hmm. I always like harmonies. I, I've always liked uh, the, that, the band from the very beginning. Uh, uh, the song Hotel California, I always listen to it all the, way through, all the way through. Because when it gets all the guitar stuff, I can totally identify with all the work that those guys did to make that come off. Um, I can't imagine how tough that was to make those lines playing exactly spot on together. That's, you know, they're good. They're, you know, you go back to listen to like Skinner's, uh, uh, free bird. And it's kind of like, and most of that was by chance. It was not, uh, the double guitars on the end were not necessarily, uh, playing that way because they've, they've been playing that song and everything. So, I guess what variations that uh, Alan played on the solo on that thing, they were all in the same. They brought, maybe they, I was not there. I was there on some of the overdubs for that, but not all of it. I was not there on the final choice of what parts were played where. But also, I do know that Al Cooper was capable. That arrangement of that song is incredible. The whole yeah. en ending part I'm talking mm -hmm. about. And listen to it. I could sit there and listen to that over and over and just hear the little different, the drums, the different parts they played on those eight measures. The acoustic guitars are actually valid in that uh, end of that song. And, uh, you know, I've never listened for that. Now I have to listen for the acoustic it's, it's, It changes so much and everything. And it, uh, but the, the guitar stuff is kind of like bring, bring up those two tracks, bring it back one track, bring up the other and find out, wow, this actually worked real well together. I don't know where it was a, an uh, now moment or not uh an epiphany that uh, made all that uh, come together on the end but uh i i give a lot of that to alan collins I, he was that kind of player that kind of good too uh it's so, okay for for our second album i think uh i enjoy uh fleetwood mac's uh rumors album quite a bit uh the the songs and the uh and I still can't get over just how uh, Mick Fleetwood, the drums are just so solid behind those songs. Nothing is ever overplayed and yeah. the texture and the harmonies and what's his name's guitar player is play stuff that Lindsay, is that Lindsay Buckingham? Yep. And that yeah. nobody else plays, yeah. you know, as a, that guitar he's got, whoever built that guitar for him, he has got it down, had to a science and it's kind of like wow that's some really really cool stuff and i also like uh steely dan quite a bit too yeah and it's not necessarily albums but there's just particular songs here and there uh and i have to you know say three i have to go back to beach boys uh you know and everybody says pet sounds and i love pet sounds but i like i, I like some of the other records they did too they were they were just fun sounding records. And, and to this day, when I hear all those harmonies that, uh, yeah, great harm. Incredible. And Cause I grew up. Some of my favorite things to listen to was the, uh, four freshmen. Uh, and there was, there was three or four male trios or, or four guys singing and everything. And I love the way those records sounded and everything. Um, uh, like the Letterman Be stuff like that. Yes, exactly. And the, right. and so when the Beach Boys came out, they kind of took those uh, modes of harmonies and stuff and everything, and actually made them uh, even better and everything. And to this day, I don't know how they pulled some of that stuff off. I saw, I saw just so recently saw a thing where Brian Wilson's in the studio, you know, and it's it's kind of like them doing multiple takes one after another, and he's kind of telling how Blaine, you got no, you got to on the intro, you got to hit this and do that and it's kind of like just all this minute detail and then after they get the music track laid down then they go out there and, and he's got all these harmony parts figured out and it's not like you know every guy's got his own mic 
and they're all going to separate tracks and it's a blend of those guys and it it's a phenomenal direct you know just kind of we as a band uh could not could not get into some of the later stuff that they did at all but we love doing beach boy stuff and uh so from an engineering standpoint, you could appreciate the workmanship that went involved in creating Absolutely. Yeah, I, okay. I it, totally it, get and that. And these man. parts to, to stand out, you know, to me, it's like, uh, what's his name saying? The bass parts on this thing, love, would do these bass parts. But instead of me, I'd probably exaggerate the low frequencies in his voice. But those things were kind of like the low end rolled out. It's just the those parts came through without it being a, you know, they would be real distinct and everything. And uh I'm still in love. I still love all that stuff. Uh, the most, uh, I still got to say, uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band was, uh, one of my favorite albums. There's songs on there that, you know, the Beatles are something that I don't have to listen to for a while. And then it's all I want to listen to for a while. Right. Um, and uh, that was that was a good time to be in music, and I was in some some of that stuff, a little bit of that stuff. I was playing. We, when we first started out as a band, we were playing ventures, the ventures, oh, sure. instrumental stuff, and then Beach Boys came out, and the, the songs were kind of like, you know, about cars and all this stuff, but the harmonies that left things. So we learned a lot of their songs, and uh, and we were. We were doing R and B stuff, you know, the little Anthony and Imperials. We were doing flamingo stuff. We we did lots of songs that had a lot of harmony, but never on a comparable basis with uh, any of the people I'm talking about. You know, Fleetwood Mac. I always loved the sounds of their harmonies on stuff and everything. Uh, but it, you know, there, I could probably instead of three, I could probably put about five together. You already and, gave me gave me five. <laughs> You've exceeded your quota already, Mister Mills. <laughs> well that to me like today that's good tomorrow i'll be saying oh and man by tonight it'll be different <laughs> tonight it'll be it's this you can't pick that and here's the deal you know what the biggest thing what grooviest thing nowadays is you go on youtube and you're going to look for one specific thing and you look on the side over there and say oh, <laughs> i really like that and that takes you somewhere else and that it's takes so you somewhere cool. else and it's kind of like, so you don't have this little record thing of all this past you've taken in, in the last two and a half, three hours on these individual songs. And, but it's cool to get on there every now and then kind of get lost in the, uh, haze in the days. It's like last night. It's wonderful. Trying to look up, uh, when I bought my first record, I look up the best songs of the, uh, say 1956. Uh huh. I knew every one of them because says go to 1955. I know all of those songs. I know all the songs. Go back to 1954, and we start getting into some of the big band stuff and the McGuire sisters and uh, and the uh, Drifters and not the Drifters, but uh, I can't Tatters. think of the name now. But, but just old stuff, old stuff. My, and then we finally get back down to the, almost the uh, early 50s and everything before Elvis came out. And there's still stuff in there that I I just got. My mother and dad had that record player, and we played records all the time. And they had these records it was kind of like a generation before me and i got to listen to those quite a bit you know there was some big lee dorsey and the big band stuff and and uh and uh by well, i remember just uh learning to dance to in the mood uh you know my cousin had a record player at her house and we'd gather up over there and uh Oh, Leah, my wife and i still you know that's one thing the good thing i think about uh xm radio is as you can go from that 10 year bounce. Oh yeah. One channel to another. And it's yeah. kind of like, wow. And, and Mary and I bad, we get back to the fifties and we know all the songs we can sing along with all the songs. <laughs> you get into the eighties and nineties and maybe we don't know the songs as well as we do, but we remember those old, old songs. Um, uh, I think, you know, the main thing to me, I like a lot of uh, music. I think the main thing I got into music and got into uh, doing what I do is how much the emotion of a song can get to you. 
Oh yeah, I, th that's, I think that's everybody's. And you, uh, you know. even going back to the fifties, you know, it's like they sing these songs, and it's kind of like you get you hear it on the radio, and you look across at the girl you got on a date, and you say, "This is what I'd like to say to her," but I turn it up a little bit, makes you think <laughs> that feeling. But and getting on into the music I was involved in, it's still everything that you try to I tried to do to try to get a little emotion into it. And it's kind of like, even when I'm mastering stuff, I'll, I'll try to make, put a slant on some things where I think this maybe put a little bit more edge on this and make it sound a little bit more forceful because it's what this song is about and everything. So this is why you want it to come across. You don't want it just to lay there and the, and the lyrics are really something that's kind of in your face and the music's not supporting that. And that's one of the best things I found about guitar. The foundation of every song to me is like bass and drums. And the guitar is the thing that always adds to the emotions. Lights and, the match. And it's the reinforces match. that song. Yeah. And, the, and the lyrics are really important, but the guitar can make the lyrics even better. Yeah. And if done the right way. And, uh, and just uh, be involved in music sometimes. And, you know, you're doing that and everything. And you're kind of like... Uh, it's like uh, when you're doing that and it comes and it turns out the way you didn't think it was going to necessarily going to turn out, but it turns out even better. Yeah. That's about as good as it gets. And I remember sitting there next to Danny Toler, Dan Toler one night and he's playing this thing and it's just awesome. He's done this work and everything. And we've done all this punch in and we've done this thing that I do and everything where fix this and do that. And he looks over at me, he says, Rodney, you're the best producer best producer i've ever worked with and it's kind of like i don't think i'm doing anything that's that's pretty cool <laughs> that's that was uh later on that was actually really special you know it's kind of like and it's kind of like when he said that i just kind of threw it away you know and it's kind of like but later on it's kind of well you don't get much better than that when uh you think no, that that's really cool man but you, you know the thing is in the, you've got to be motivated by ego to hang on to something like that in the immediate moment like you're gonna you know most people are not again most you know. of, yeah so i mean that's really nice though hey uh that what it's, it's a tough one what do you like most about yourself speaking of which besides that you're the best producer dan told <laughs> ever worked with <laughs> i like uh i like the fact that uh that i'm persevere and things that uh that doesn't doesn't necessarily make sense to anybody else but me and uh sometimes i work on stuff and somebody's get it say this is my budget and uh and i know that i'm not going to be satisfied with what i do at spending that budget so i just go do what ever i think it takes to make that what i th want it to sound like and uh, yeah and just have, you know, sometimes it doesn't make any sense, but, but if it does come out the way you want it to sound like, you know, I can't tell a person, you know, that I know they've got 250 bucks to spend and I'm going to do you a $5,000 mix. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and so that's just not a possibility. I like the fact, you know, the, the years that I would sit in the control rooms or sit with people and everything and would work on stuff that was not easy and just persevere through it and uh, just try to be supportive and uh, and and kind of go the extra mile with people and uh, and with myself too. I kind of like that about myself, even though it drives some some of my people kind of crazy sometimes. You still working on that? <laughs> yeah, but that's yeah. the guy you want to work with, man. To be honest with you. Uh, yeah then it's yeah that's the guy i want to give my money to anyway <laughs> no seriously i mean you know the guy who's like you still working on it oh thank you you know <laughs> <laughs> call uh, me silly but that's uh, <laughs> uh tell me toughest decision you ever had to make or most difficult thing you had to do I thought about this. I, I, I don't know the most difficult thing. Most one of the most difficult thing was to take that 
positive things that was going on between me and the Atlanta rhythm section. And I'd stuck with them so many years yeah. to see the end become a reality that we'd always dreamed of. And to, uh, and to say, do I want to stay with this or do I do want to go back in the studio with Skinner and work on their album? And that was a, probably one of the toughest decisions I made doing the thing from not pursuing more music production things and starting this mastering stuff was a tough, tough decision. Uh, one thing I just did, I had no skill set that I knew of that that would directly relate to mastering. And, uh, and I knew that if I wanted to do that to any degree, uh, it would, keep me from doing I, it was not like you get to the point where you're getting 15 projects a week and somebody offers you a month gig doing a record project well those what are you going to do i yeah. tried that on tried that on one thing i went up to nashville to do a thing for a week and i'd try to come and master stuff with a little set of speakers to try to master stuff and it's kind of like i finally just said no this is my first this is where i got to do i think that those are kind of like hard decisions and everything that yeah. uh, turned out pretty well. Bad decisions. We it's, all got those, man. Let me tell you. I think one of the when the thirty eighth record, Wild Eyes Southern Boys, went uh, gold and especially went platinum, and I knew how much money I was going to get on my first royalty check. I became the rookie baseball player that signing his first big, huge, mega <laughs> contract. I went to buy a uh, Cadillac uh, Fleetwood Brahms and bass boats. <laughs> there you go, man. Do you fish? Are you a fisher? Do you fish? I, not so much anymore, but I used to fish all the time. We had a, when 38 was doing really well, we had a house down here on the beach and I had a pretty big boat and we'd go out in the middle of the ocean. I loved all that. Uh, now I'm kind of like a guy that likes to go out and fish, catch something we can cook for a meal <laughs> that night instead yeah. of spending hundreds of bucks going offshore and that kind of stuff. That I was a lot bass. of fun. Bass fishing is so much fun, man. It's got into that, oh, I got into that buddy buoy and I got in at the same time. We had these big high powered bass boats and uh, we'd <laughs> run all over these lakes. Uh, never catch any fish. <laughs> well, there's so many nice lakes here in, in Florida and Georgia. That's yes. the thing. Yeah, there's some yes. really good places here, man. Uh, and last question, and man, again, I just want to say thank you so much for everything. And I could talk to you for three times this amount of time, but yeah, <laughs> it's been really great hearing all this experience you have, and I appreciate you sharing it. Well, so thank, you. thank thank you, Greg, for you you know you push this in a good way. I read all your bio stuff and everything. I said, man, this guy has done a lot, and uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> if, and it kind of explained how you were able to kind of uh, promote this thing. You're yourself and everything and stay enthused about it because it sounds like you've done a lot of promotional stuff before in your past and everything but yeah. this is something you really love doing and everything oh god yeah yeah this is so and cool so, and there's a yeah i think there's a lot of people you've talked to a lot of people and everything and it's all cool i my problem is a lot of times is uh i'm not the guy that goes out and hears live bands all the time and does does all that uh, everything it's kind of like I think I got full. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. When I was about 68 or 69. <laughs> no, this is great. This is. Oh, thank you. This is very cool. So uh, last, last question. What is it going to be? It's going to be name a car. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> starts with the letter L. Look at those silly questions they ask on these TV shows, right? Uh, tell me the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years, Rodney, and how much of that has been intentional and how much is just a natural part of aging? Uh, I'll tell you, boy, the decision I made to, to kind of stop pursuing all the recording projects and everything, is it really allowed my personality to be a lot more laid back and, uh, and not to... Uh, to get over the top about most everything because what I'm doing at this mastering point and everything is, uh, does not require you getting into an extreme excitable, <laughs> uh, state like always comes in a recording project. Mm -hmm. uh, so my, my personality has become more laid back and, and then that's because it had to, 
I've had uh, open heart surgery twice. Holy smoke! How are you doing now? You great, right? great. Wow, to, that's that's heavy stuff, man. Holy Craig, smokes, Craig! I had my first. I had my heart attack when I was on a plane going to San Francisco to work with a band called Y and T. Yeah, I know them. I was to start production with them, and uh, get on the plane coming down to San Francisco. I oh, really oh bad. my god! And the plane landed, pulled up the gate, and I passed out. And uh, so the long short of it, I went up in the hospital, and I had minor heart attack, if there's such a thing. But uh, came back home and they did this uh, balloon thing, angioplasty thing in Atlanta. And uh, then they wound up doing quad uh, oh, bypass surgery. Quad bypasses after that, because uh, I was starting to feel bad, and uh, I was going getting ready to go up to Nashville to do a recording session. And the doctor I knew, uh, Bill Mayfield, who uh, Jeff Carlis was very good friends with, uh, he was out of town, and uh, and I was having this problems with my heart and everything went to see a doctor and everything gave me all these pills i went home felt terrible so bill mayfield came back into town and called me up and he said uh rodney i want you to come by and i said they they went in and did a catheterization and took film you know my heart and he says i want to go over this film with you these guys did and talk talk to you about it and everything i says bill i'm i'm on my way to nashville i've got i got seven musicians in a recording studio booked and the artist is already up there and his words to me was he picked the right ones he said well i'm gonna give you the names of a couple of doctors at vanderbilt university because you may need them while you're there wow i said okay what i need to do yeah, i'll be right over this oh. is nine nine thirty at night and he says i want you to be back down here at six o'clock in the morning and I'm gonna fix this for you, man. What a good guy! He got me pre-admitted. I didn't even have time to get thinking. What are they gonna do? The the life support thing, you know, where they stop your lungs because they can't they can't have all that stuff going in and out. So they stop your lung, put a, put you on a respirator in you, and they stop your blood and put you on a machine that. Holy so, smokes! So I'm not realizing any of this stuff, especially the respirator part. So I go under and everything and, and I come to, and I feel like I'm underwater and I can't get a breath. That's scary as hell. That's that respirator. And they got that thing out on me right away. And I, I recovered from that pretty quick bill. You know, it's kind of like, he said, you need to do this for so many weeks and do this for so many weeks. And then you could do anything you want to. And he put those bypasses in they and they stayed good for close to 17, 18 years where he told me several years later, after he'd done, he says, Rodney, those things usually only last about 10 years. I thought, what? <laughs> wow. Is this like a fa congenital? Did your dad have anything like this? Yes. Oh man. But he, he never would have any kind of surgery or anything, but it wound up. The, after the second time I went out to my uh, mother's funeral and walking real fast through the airport there came that feeling again and uh, I had I'd had two stents put in after the after the first one they go through the second, you know we did two stents okay I got these stents this is great four months after I get the stents in I'm go walk through the airport and I have to go and take a uh, one nitroglycerin pill for the first time wow and that fixed it it and coming home from california it seemed like going to, and this was my mother lived out close to san francisco all this stuff seemed to happen to me around san francisco coming home to atlanta we got atlanta going through the airport had to take another one so they uh stents closed up in four months and so they had to do open me back up put two stents two uh, bypasses around where the stents were and, well, they're, and they're still there. They're there. You can't get them back out. And so since then, I'm done good. You know, it's kind of like they tried to fix the stents. The doctor was supposed to be the whiz kid of of Atlanta and that whole area and everything. And he's the one that put them in. So I went back there to, for him to try to open them back up. 
And uh, after they tried that, they came in and said, well, we could, we couldn't make it good. We can make it a little bit bad. We, no, they didn't do that. They actually looked at the film. My first, my regular doctor, cardiac cardiologist, he tried to go in and open them up. He couldn't do it. So he sent me back over to this other hospital where they'd put them in. And they looked at the film and they came in, the doctor came in my room, said, Mr. Mills, we, the best we could do is go in there and uh, make them a little bit better. So immediately me and Mary, Mary and I are thinking the same thing. So it took four months this time. So next time it's going to be two months from now. Yeah. And then it's going to be one month. And yeah. So Mary, my wife, thank goodness. Uh, she has seen me through all my mishaps in my life. Like, my third degree burns on all my hands when we were not even engaged, but she asked the doctor, she says, if this is your dad, what would you do? He says, I would see a surgeon. And it's kind of like, they're going to open me back up. And then to find out they got to go open you back up in the same incision you already have through scar tissue and all that stuff. So the surgeon that actually did the thing, he came in to meet me. Uh, his name is Dr. Myung. Myung. Yeah. And I heard his name. I said, he's not going to be able to speak English. And, but he came in. He's from California. And he <laughs> says, he says uh, Mr. Mills, I've done, I've done 400 of these. He's the Rodney Mills of... <laughs> Of, uh, of stents of open heart surgery. Heart surgery. <laughs> he says he told me all the negative things. He says this is really hard, you know, going back through all that uh all that uh scar tissue in there. He says, but I can do it. I could do it. I just want to tell you I could do it. So he, he came over and shook my hand, Craig, and his hand was about half as big as mine. Said, <laughs> That's the guy I want probing yeah. around. <laughs> oh god. So how long ago was the last one? Uh between two and three years ago you're okay now you feel good i'm okay i'm okay i, I walked down here and great no comfort and at uh my dad golly he was those nitroglycerin pills he was just doing them all day long towards the end if i'd talk him into uh he wouldn't do it wouldn't get surgery yeah but you know that was probably so many years ago who knows if even you know what I don't, yeah. you know, medicine technology it's like like the internet man the me medical technology so rapidly advances you know so quickly so yeah. wow i'm glad you're okay that's heavy stuff man it is heavy stuff it is heavy stuff and it's the things that you know i think there's thing there things the hardest things i've kind of gone through you know i walked into a house when i was uh, young and and I uh, thought there was, they'd put the gas, propane gas in this tank outside. And so I was going to check this heater to see if they'd done it. And there was somebody taking a heater out of another room in the back of the house and just left the open pipe. Oh my. So it's full of gas. I walked in, started over towards this heater and I struck a match and the whole place blew up. Holy smokes. And I was still playing in a band at that time. And, and uh, that was 30 days in the hospital for that. And, uh, so you walked away from a, an ex a house that exploded while you it, were in it. it. The front door of the place, it blew it clean across the highway to the other side. I walked out where there was a wall. That's like a miracle, man. Seriously. Seriously. If, if, if when that thing went off, I just went, <gasps> it would have gotten all sucked down in my lungs and everything. Of course, my uncle, the same guy that gave me the $5, he was telling everybody he ain't going to make it. <laughs> 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 oh man <laughs> so holy but, smokes yeah i've been through a lot a lot of stuff a lot of uh stuff that the health stuff and everything is kind of like i don't really need to be in those situations where it's kind of like you've got agitated people you got come some people expecting this they want to do that and you're trying you just all, all the time just trying to stay on top of everything and and make sense and and all that uh i think this is decision i made to do this stuff is prolonged my life you know I'm, yeah it sounds like it and some good decision on your part maybe <laughs> well listen man i i want to hear the rest of the story in about 25 years <laughs> you, you got a lot more records to make man 
Listen, thank you so much for everything. I, 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 you're really a, this has been a treat for me. Thank you very much. Jeff Carlisi and Jeff Carlisle. Thank you both. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you are, I'm Rodney don't need this, but if you're interested in working with Rodney and have him master your music, go to his website. It's, it's Rodney Mills, R O D N E Y mills.com. Reach out to him through there. Um, and you'll get a job extremely well done. Um, Anything, is there anything else? Any final words of wisdom? No. That, that, you know, it's got like, I feel, I, I feel like I've lived forever, but I still want to live a lot longer. <laughs> you ever spent this much time talking with the Yankee? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Hey, man, no. Hang on, let me wrap this up. Thank, <laughs> thank you for everything. Hang on one no. sec. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thank you very much to Rodney Mills for all the all the lifelong of wonderful music you've contributed to my life. And I know to everybody else's life who's listening. If Again, if you want to work with Rodney, go to his website, rodneymills.com. And most important, man, especially nowadays, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar or mix or whatever the hell you like doing and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Brother, thank you so much for everything. You're welcome. Thank you, Greg. You're welcome.